Cool. Yeah, we ready yeah. to go? We are. Yes, we are. We are. Thank you so much for making the trip all the way out here. I'm delighted to talk to you guys. Um, the book that you have written, The Alzheimer's Solution, is it's super powerful, and uh, I have no doubt that it's already helping lots of people and has the potential to really be a healing, uh, you know, curative um, treatment for so many people. Like it's a it's an incredible work and. Uh, I'm just so excited to unpack it with you guys. So thank you for coming out. Thank you for having me. Thank you so much for having us. Right. So we met uh, at Rachel's event initially, right? At Rachel Abrams' event. So we share Rachel and Doug Abrams as common friends. Uh, Doug, I went to college with Doug. Oh, my goodness. Yeah, he was a college classmate of mine. And I've had Doug and Rachel have both been on the podcast about a year ago. So it comes full circle. And here we are talking. So I think maybe um, the best way to kind of launch into this is perhaps to define our terms a little bit. You know, what do we mean when we're talking about Alzheimer's? And, And perhaps it would be worth explaining the difference between Alzheimer's and other forms of dementia. Yeah. So um, Alzheimer's is a fairly new disease in the sense that it's, it's beginning to be well known in, the, in, 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 in our society, especially first world society. It's not a new disease in the sense as far as uh, a new infection or something of that nature. It was been known for 100 years or so and mm-hmm. defined by Dr. Alzheimer's. Of all people, it's like 1901 or something yeah, like that. Yeah, exactly. And but but uh, for longest time, even now in many communities, they call it senility. They call it part of just normal aging. Just today, I saw a patient, full blown Alzheimer's, advanced. The family didn't know they, that this person mm-hmm. had Alzheimer's, and all the things they had to do, either to prevent or even now that they have it, to how to uh, deal with it. Alzheimer's is a subcategory of the bigger disease process, which is dementia. Dementia is the big group, which is uh, like cancer and Alzheimer's is a subtype of it. Mm -hmm. Um, But it's the biggest category. 60 to 70% of all dementias is Alzheimer's. Mm. And um, since 1990s, when first President Reagan was diagnosed, and from then on, it became more known and more studied and billions of dollars spent in, in, in research in the field. So why... You say it's a relatively new disease. I mean, it's discovered in 1901, Correct. and we're, now we're seeing, you know, seeing it at epidemic levels, and the Correct. growth curve is insane. So, what is, you know, why is it a recent disease? Why is it just coming online now, and why is it accelerating at such a rapid mm. rate? I was, it was a play on words. It's not a dis- new disease in the sense that it, uh, in the human experience, it's a new disease as far as our understanding of it. Mm-hmm. Its prevalence, its massive growth. I mean, we're talking about every other disease in decline, pretty much every other disease or death from every other disease in decline. Yet mortality and death from Alzheimer's in just the last 10 years has grown more than 80%. Mm. Part of that is because we're aging society. We're doing better with the, 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 yeah, we have more diabetes. We have more obesity. We have more of all these other diseases, but we're surviving them with machines, with surgeries, with these catheters, all these things we're living past what we would have lived before. Right. We can survive diseases we that can used, survive. To, used to kill us. Exactly. Absolutely. But when it comes to uh, what's left behind is our brain. At the end of the day, we're left with our brain. And that's the cumulative problems over 50, 60 years that actually end up in being Alzheimer's at the end or dementia mm-hmm. in general Alzheimer's. And that's where we bring um, the new kind of conversation that uh, we have to approach it in that sense. Mm-hmm. We have to approach it as a lifestyle disease. And, and uh, that's why it's so important. Right. And we're going we're gonna to work our way towards that. But just to kind of lay a little foundation, when I was going through your book, I mean, the, the statistics are staggering. Six leading cause of death, but perhaps as high as third because mm-hmm. it's so underreported. $226 billion are spent in the U.S. to treat this. And it's looking like, or, and $604 billion worldwide, it's working its way towards the trillions. By 2050, we're looking at 135.5 million people suffering from this disease. I mean, this is something that's, if it's not touching you directly, it's certainly touching you indirectly. Absolutely. I think it's probably one of the scariest things out there. And, you know, you quoted the numbers. Um, and 
It's so sad that all this research throughout the years by big organizations, mm -hmm. whether it's Alzheimer's Association or others, um, they haven't really done much. There, there's really no medication for this for this disease. There is this incredible failure rate for uh, for finding a treatment for Alzheimer's disease, about a 99.6% failure rate. It's like insane. Is yeah. it's like, how can you even call it like right. a, a medication worth even considering with that level of failure rate? Exactly. There is no there is no treatment for it. And, you know, the, the minute number actually are medications that are used for allaying some of the symptoms. For a few years. Yeah, just for a few years. It doesn't work long term at all. So... Mm -hmm. And there is, the reason is because everybody has been focusing on one molecule, on one small process, instead of stepping back and looking at the bigger picture and the complexity of the right. disease. So, yeah, I think, I think there's a lot to be done in that area. Yeah, I mean, it was basically a death sentence. You would go to your doctor mm -hmm. and the doctor would say, well, we'll try to make you comfortable. And uh, here are some options in terms of places where you can get assistance with your lifestyle, but you're, you're just going to ride this out and yeah. that's it. Yeah. And we see these pharmaceuticals that are available now, but they really just don't, they're just, they're, they're not effective. Not at all. Not at all. It's so depressing being a neurologist in that field. Um, because you know, we went through it in the past, a person would come in, we would diagnose them with Alzheimer's disease or our supervisor, whoever the neurologist was. And the next conversation would be, you need to get ready to let go of your finances. Mm -hmm. You need to find a nursing home. You need to bring your family members so that they're aware of how you're going to lose parts of yourself as you move along. And that, that was basically it. It was it's like, no, how do you handle that as a yeah. as a doctor, having to have that conversation over and over and over again? Absolutely. It's worse than it's a death sentence. Yeah. For a great majority, they've done studies that <clears throat> from for many Americans, it's worse than death to know that you're having Alzheimer's, and and the approach from the medical field is actually even worse. It, you have 20 minutes with a patient. Mm -hmm. Hi, how are you doing? How is it going? You do the cursory check of the heart tapping the knee and then at the you know last five minutes you have alzheimer's and this is what you have and this is what you have to do and here are some pills and the pills don't change the progression of the disease they just help you with the symptoms mm -hmm. um, this is uh this is a process that's going to increase accelerate every family every family in america will be affected by it either directly or indirectly mm -hmm. and we need to do some something to kind of either curb it or have a new approach to it mm -hmm. um and what we're doing is actually we, we whenever we bring this topic they tell us um but are you blaming the person it's not about that it's about giving hope it's about starting a new process a new direction mm -hmm. um that was the whole goal and came from our experiences in the communities we live in loma linda Right. The story of how you evolved into this perspective for, for treatment and, you know, prevention is unbelievable, right? Because you're coming, you know, you're hard-nosed scientists, you know, immersed in the scientific method, you know, raised to be doctors in the, in the Western tradition and had your experience with that and, and then kind of evolved into what you're doing now. But to give it some context, maybe let's explain a little bit of your background. I mean, I know you met in Afghanistan, which that's probably, we could spend two hours on that probably. <laughs> but, uh, but I mean, Dean, you were, you were at NIH, Correct. yes. Correct. And Aisha, you were, is it Aisha? How do I say it? Aisha. Aisha, Aisha you were at uh, UC San Diego, yeah. correct? Yes. Both practicing neurology? Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we actually came into this field because we both had grandparents who had uh, dementia, severe dementia. And, um, you know, they were incredible human beings and they were our heroes. And I remember having my grandfather's picture on my desk throughout my medical school because mm -hmm. I wanted to be like him. And I saw how slowly and gradually grandfather lost himself to the point where he didn't recognize his children, didn't recognize any of his grandchildren. And that was just devastating. I saw the pain that my parents go, went through. And for this brilliant person to slowly and gradually become a child again. Mm. So it affected us and we wanted to study neuroscience and the brain and its beauty and its complexity. 
But, you know, as you go on through the period of, you know, getting educated in the medical field, you come to a point where you're in a clinic with a dementia patient and there's really nothing you can do about it. And that was just depressing. Yeah. yeah. Well, it's such a powerlessness, it right? Is. It yeah. is. It's um, uh, UCSD is the, well, at the time with Leon, uh, we, it was number one neuroscience program in the country. Uh, NIH is an IH, and um, we were we were actually at UCSD and study after study after study, billions of dollars, a mouse model. Uh, it worked on mice, so let's apply it to humans. Again, a failure. Mm. That's at least a hundred to three hundred billion dollar a million dollars per study, you know. And it was just incredibly frustrating. First of all, the mouse, mouse models, 50, 60 things have worked on mice. For even blueberries work on mice. I mean, I think if you just look at them in the right way, they will work on the mice. Mice do not men make. And after a while, we just said, this is, this is just too it's much. So we decided to look for an alternative. We looked around. Dan Buettner um, read about him and his book, and we found out about Loma Linda. Mm-hmm. And uh, then the rest just followed. And, but, but that transition was painful and scary. Right. There were a lot of impediments in the way. Sorry to cut you off. No, please go. Because, um, you know, the way you're trained in the medicine world is to look at cause and effect and look at a linear path of how A affects B. How does A influence B and what are some of the other factors that come to it? It's very, very myopic. And the way research is funded by NIH or other governing bodies is just that, to have a linear model of looking at associations and studies after studies after studies have just looked at very mm-hmm. small things at a time and not the bigger picture. And we were so excited to see studies from Loma Linda or the Blue Zones um, coming and showing that there is a different perspective to look at. There is lifestyle. There is, you know, this complex nature of of the foods that you eat or whether you exercise or not and the interactions between these lifestyle factors, they matter. And it was painful because I remember clearly when we were um, showing interest in doing something of that nature or studying populations, we were told by our mentors and you know some of the prominent people at universities, um, things like, oh, you're, this is career suicide mm-hmm. for you. You do know that there's no future in this. If you decide to leave UCSD and this fabulous, say, for example, a molecular, molecular research that you're doing, and you're going to go and study epidemiology and population studies, nobody's going to fund your research. <laughs> right. Yeah. yeah, you're breaking ranks with, yes. uh, you know, with, with core tradition, and that's a frightening thing. It is. Um, and, you know, just to touch on what you said earlier, you know that is the the by its very nature the reductive nature of the scientific method, Absolutely. right? And there's reason and rationality for that, <clears throat> and it works in many cases, but it's inherently flawed with respect to some Agreed. ways of approaching problems, right? Because it's not just one thing; it's a it's a matrix of an infinite number of cofactors that interrelate in this interplay of things that coalesce to you know create this situation you can't you can't extract out the one variable the exactly. b12 or the beta carotene exactly or the, you know, to, exactly and and come up with a solution for this absolutely so so that's interesting so the so loma linda comes onto your radar and dan butner in his you know amazing books and all the incredible work that he's done and you decide to pack your bags and head out to the one blue zone in the united states and mm-hmm. hang out with the seventh day adventists <laughs> yeah yes. the, it, it, it was it was a frightening endeavor um, um i was the director of the brain health center she did her she so we said we're going to go all out so she did a preventive medicine residency mm-hmm. a neurology residency and then with two kids with us mm-hmm. Um, I was in Loma Linda as the director of Brain Health Center, and uh, Aisha went to Columbia University to study vascular and uh, epidemiology at Columbia mm-hmm. University. Two years, flying back and forth every two weeks. Most we said we're going to go time. all out. Oh my god! And we're going to go all out. Wow! And study. And at night, she would study culinary. I went to cooking school. Right, I know. Do you yeah. did the you did the Roubaix school? I did. No, well, I actually went to Natural Gourmet Institute, uh-huh. and then went to Ruby. Uh-huh. I did the Ruby online as well. <laughs> You're just like collecting all kinds of degrees. And, it was and fun, to be honest with you. I think you know I probably would make more difference talking to some of my patients about 
changing their dietary patterns than just pushing aspirin and statins. Mm -hmm. I found that useful in so many occasions and just, you know, personalizing lifestyle for them. So I think it was a great decision. And what is the, the rationale behind getting a degree at Columbia in what was it? Vascular? Yes, it was Epidemi- vascular neurology, neurology and epidemiology. Mm-hmm. So it was a combined um, uh, training in stroke, understanding um, diseases of the brain, especially vascular disease of the brain. And the epidemiology side highlighted prevention and understanding how disease patterns exist in the population. Mm-hmm. It was so funny that the, while, while she was there in the first year, they, they want to get you into research, molecular research. And she, she said, no, I'm going, going to study population research. She said, okay, there's this study. Uh, and uh, um, a California teacher study. Why don't you look into that data? So she flew to California, collected the data, and did that study with Mediterranean diet, plant-based component of it, and stroke. And lo and behold, she that paper was highly touted. She won the youngest researcher award for American Heart Association. And uh-huh. the Columbia people all of a sudden turned her oh, so, so everybody was excited. So she was the youngest plenary uh-huh. speaker in the American Heart Association, <laughs> was, talking was about lifestyle and stroke mm. so the very thing that they thought that would not really make it amount to anything all of a sudden turned out to so every step we've taken completely non-traditional has turned out to actually resonate and make a difference and hers the show that what the, the more people lived a plant-based lifestyle closer to adherence yes as low as 44 44- had low had about you know forty percent lower risk of having strokes. Wow, forty percent, forty percent. We have no drug population. That's amazing. Yeah. So when you're in this situation in San Diego, being frustrated with you know the sort of standard operating procedure of, of treating these these patients with dementia, did you? I mean, were you already? looking at lifestyle and getting interested in that and were you sold on that and the plant-based diet and all of that or did that come in turn with coming out to Loma Linda and kind of immersing yourself in 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 the way that they are tackling these problems and looking at how people are living in that in that part of the world yeah as a scientist you want to make sure that your your personal biases do not bias your science right that's kind of what I'm getting at yeah yeah I know and 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 we were already um, um, vegetarians for other reasons. Um, um, we are um, for ethical reasons mm-hmm. and all that. And this came in, in the middle of Afghanistan, of all places. We we decided that we're, we're going vegetarian, vegetarian in Afghanistan. Afghanistan. Yes, and and that in itself is a another book uh-huh. of of the slippery slope <laughs> of uh, well, you know. I was the deputy minister of health. I went from NIH to Afghanistan, oh, wow. became the youngest deputy minister, created this whole women's empowerment. But the, my downfall was that I became vegetarian. Uh-huh. Nothing else. Oh, All that the was like political easy. suicide, suicide. For you? Yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. Almost. Almost, yeah. yeah. Okay. Wow. Absolutely. But, um, but, but that aside, when we came to Loma Linda, we really, even now, we, for example, some of the things we say is sugar is worse. Mm-hmm. Um, but we, we, we let the science do the talking. We, we, as a scientist, you can't let your personal biases direct the science. But the science is just overwhelming. It's not just us. It's, you know, yeah, you get these little blurbs of fad diets here and there. Let's do keto. Let's do this. Let's Mm -hmm. do that. Plant-based living has been proven over 100 years. Thousands of papers. Validated papers. It doesn't mean that somebody just did one little paper. Five other people repeated it. This has been powerfully shown. The Adventist Health Study showed that people who live a certain life, more plant-based, live 10 years longer and healthier than everybody else. In JAMA, not just a regular journal, top journal in the mm-hmm. world that was published, and many other things. Cancer risk is lower and everything else. The only thing that was left to show was brain. Mm-hmm. So we studied the brain. And uh, while there, we actually looked at my clinic, or our clinic, which we saw thousands of people. And this is at the center of this Seventh-day Adventist community. There's nowhere else for them to go. Right. Either they come to me or they just stay home as far as... Uh, yeah, and you're, you're looking for candidates to study, yes, right? And there's yes. nobody to study because yeah. there's you go to the gym and everyone's 90 and they're doing push-ups. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, Dr. Yes. Wareham did yeah. surgery at 95. It's insane. It yeah. is. And yeah. he's still running around, you know. Is it, yeah, he's, he not, he's not practicing medicine anymore, right? No, no, no. He retired because he wanted to travel. Right. Yeah. Not because he had a tremor or he was right. feeling tired. He's just an incredible 
strong uh, and very very healthy person. I, I had patients now. eighty something saying that uh, you know I'm running the the marathon in, in LA. Uh, are you joining? I'm, I was like a little embarrassed. I was like, yeah, no, not this year. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But, but this is an eighty something year old running a marathon. I mean, that's uh-huh. amazing. Yeah, it's not unusual uh, to see that on a regular basis. Absolutely. So so this is uh, and then uh, the clinics were more people from outside right right so, beyond 10 so yeah so you come to Loma Linda we're gonna study brain health we need all these people that we can evaluate to create this population study <laughs> no one's showing up at the clinic no. and ultimately you have to kind of uh, go across the tracks over right. to San Bernardino where there's a lower lower socioeconomic class of people and people are, are suffering terribly there from all manner of lifestyle illnesses yes. absolutely the disparity is just enormous and um, the devastation that you see from Alzheimer's disease and other, you know, all the other risk mm-hmm. factors for Alzheimer's disease is just incredible. And so, it, you know, of course, you know, they're the same population. They're living under the same sun and probably the same zip code and they have the same supermarkets and restaurants. So it had to be something else. And that gave us a very good opportunity to compare the populations and study lifestyle and how it affects brain health. It's so crazy. Yeah. Yeah, Like on over here, you have people in Loma Linda who are living crazy long lives, active lives. And, you know, literally, you know, right next door, you have a population of people who are having an extremely different experience. That's right. And that's that's a great place to um, begin a study. Right. I mean, that juxtaposition is quite potent. Dean and I would um, go to some of the churches and some of the synagogues in the area to speak about brain health and you know how many talks have we done yeah over a hundred talks and i say that i've given more talks in churches than some of the, mm-hmm. the ministers i mean we we went to church after church after church in order to draw people because i think right. it's a great place you know um and and they were very willing the catholic diocese and everybody to willing to listen and it was overwhelming yeah yeah, most of their male leaders, faith leaders, were not there. It was mostly run by women because they uh, would pass away, uh, you know, after, say, for example, age sixty-five. Mm. You would you would barely find anyone beyond age sixty-five there, and the ones that were there were you know had a lot of health issues. So it was quite prominent, even without doing any research, just by having conversations with you know the the the, the society, the communities. Um, that there was this incredible amount of um, need for health awareness and disease prevention. Mm-hmm. So you then spend the better part of the next like 15 years studying studying these correct, people, right? Correct, correct. Absolutely. I mean, my PhD thesis was on seeing how you can get information into different communities. And this is a little bit of digression, but um, uh, we looked at uh, African American, Hispanic, and Caucasian population. Or it's not even we realize that it's not even the race thing; it's socioeconomic and availability and access. Access is always access mm-hmm. to information, access to right foods, and all that. Um, in in certain populations, this lower socioeconomic information, knowledge about stroke, about dementia, about all these diseases was non-existent. It was just disease of aging, just a clump. And access to the kind of foods, the kind of environment to walk, the kind of communities that actually build around health, the blue zones we were talking, was not available. Mm-hmm. And and then most importantly, where they deemed, where they thought that that information could be given to them, they could be receptive, we had it all wrong. You know, a survey that was created in Boston and in, in Harvard or Harvard, and and then applied <laughs> by you know sixty year old, fifty year old uh, men to 70 year old Hispanic women doesn't make sense. Yeah. So we realize that that's not where you do the training. That's not where you do the education, the clinics, it's in the communities. That's where, uh, actually that's where this whole book, uh, we created the um, community driven brain health uh, or healthy minds initiative. Mm -hmm. And all the profits from the book will go into building community awareness in different communities throughout the world as far as brain health is concerned. Mm -hmm. So these people start coming into your clinic and 
the idea was what? Like, we want to understand how all of these people are living, what is contributing to this disease of the brain, and start experimenting with protocols to reverse it or prevent it. Correct. Is that sort of the, the, the master statement behind this? That's exactly right. Yeah. And then what do you start to learn? So we collect data on nutrition, exercise, the things that we know. Um, you know, uh, The only thing that we didn't collect uh, was stress, but um, as far as physical activity, as far as, um, you know, uh, uh, all these elements, sleep um, and mental activity, not profound data, just superficial data, just, every, just conversational, and we collected it. And over and over again, we realized that the people that were healthy, 90-year-old that just had minor memory problems, they were the people that kept their mind active. They, they walked all the time. They were more plant-based diet consistently. That was the uh, component. And we realized, oh, so this is, yeah, genetics. Put that aside. That cannot be genetics. It cannot be driving, driven by genes. It had to be environment um, and thousands of patients. So we started applying it. Uh, we didn't apply it to Alzheimer's patients. We applied it to people with what they call mild cognitive impairment, people who, have, who are at risk, very high risk. People who are mild cognitive impairment, they have a, a 50% of them go on to develop Alzheimer's. Mm -hmm. So we applied the, the, these, these changes, small changes, according to what they could do. And even small changes affected their livelihood, their, their progression. Mm -hmm. uh, this was miraculous, remarkable. So um, from there, we, we decided to do something bigger. Um, and um, that's where we are now. And when you were seeing those changes, like how are you uh, quantifying yeah. like cognitive degeneration versus improvement? So there, there are measurable metrics, for example, the MOCA and the mini mental status. And then there's these bigger neuropsych batteries, which is two hours where you do really long paper and pencil and find out where people's changes are. Repeatedly, you would see differences in those. There are other measures such as MRIs, which actually you measure the volume of the brain. And even those, you saw some changes. Mm. When it comes to the human brain, what's interesting, it's not the volume. You know, we have 87 billion neurons yes. and a, a one quadrillion potential connections. So this machine, what they say, one times 10 to the 50th power, it's not the cells. We could lose a billion cells. Of course, not all at once, that would mm. be bad, but slowly we could lose a billion uh -huh. cells. But the rest is what matters. And that's the concept of cognitive reserve, which is incredibly exciting. Um, and that basically means that it's not the number of cells that uh, determine your uh, cognitive prowess. It's actually the connections. And the exciting thing is those connections are made and broken on a daily basis. It's up to us what we do to create those connections. And it's like putting money in a bank account for a rainy day. You know, making more connections actually staves off disease, but at the same time builds a better brain so you feel sharper, better, um, and you know, bring forth the full capacity of the brain. And I think you know, this, is, this is the language that we use in our clinic, and this is the language that we've tried to use in our research as well to make people understand that it's in their power mm -hmm. to actually make it happen in their lives. Yeah, the brain is so mysterious, right? In so many ways. And, and that idea that, you know, I don't know whether it's apocryphal or, or to what extent it's true that we're only using a small portion of it and that we could lose all these cells, but that it's more about how we're using what we have, mm -hmm. yeah. right? They're yeah. saying that we use 10%, but actually we use all of the brain, but we use it incredibly inefficiently. So uh, we, let's, uh, a lot of people compare the brain to a muscle. And I say, what a disservice to the brain. To compare right. it to a muscle. I mean, <laughs> way big, more complicated. <laughs> way, way more powerful yeah. and resilient. So the biggest guy we know, let's say Arnold Schwarzenegger, that's the only one I can think of uh, at his peak. <laughs> there, 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 there are many others, that, I know. So. <laughs> uh, that, that, that he built his muscle four times the average mass, let's say. So an average brain, an average neuron can have a few connections but, or as many as 30,000 connections. That's not four times, that's 30,000 connections. So the idea is here's a neuron, and of course this is metaphoric, and here's a memory you're trying to get to. If it's a couple of connections to that piece of memory, one of them at age 70 is severed by a little microvascular infarct, and another one by an amyloid plaque, there it is, the memory's gone. Mm. Of course I'm making it. Imagine there are 30,000 uh, connections to that piece of information, it will never be severed. That's the power that you have by building these connections. And actually, they've done experiments where they can see it grow on a daily basis. 
that's what we can do on a day. So, and we understand how to grow those, like how yes. to strengthen, how to create more of those connections. You and I are doing it right now. Well, the longer we talk, the less likely we are to forget each other. Correct. <laughs> Challenge. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So one of the things, sorry, I'm going to digress, but one of the things people say, what do I do for brain activities? I said, not Sudoku. I hate Sudoku. If I have to do Sudoku, I'm going to get dementia. Uh-huh. Not that there's anything <laughs> wrong with Sudoku. Yeah. It's too, uh, if you like it, it's great, but it's not complex. It's, it's, you know, your brain did not evolve by, with adding numbers to nine. I mean, mm-hmm. when did that happen? While we were being chased by, by, by um, uh, saber-toothed tigers? No. Our brain is evolved through complexity. So one of the things we said, you want to build your brain, get a group of friends, play cards. The act of me listening to you, having sense of your emotions, you know, that's brain is being processed. Right. So your brain is processing this, your mirror neurons is checking your emotions. And my frontal lobe is processing what you just said. My memory centers goes back and sees what, what, that, what relevance that has then comes up with an answer, then the motor cortex, you've just used the entire brain plus the emotional component. That's not Sudoku. That's a, that's a complex behavior building connections. So music, music is to me is my favorite. Uh, Aisha is a professional singer. I'm, I say I'm the worst guitarist in history of mankind. Yeah. He's not. Uh, but the cacophony I create is, uh, you know, you're listening to your own music you're playing, which is motor cortex with the fingers. You're memorizing, remembering, recalling some tunes or some notes. So that's your memory centers. You're processing that through how it's supposed to be played. In my case, it's just simple. Uh, and that involves the entire brain plus the emotional component. Mm-hmm. That's building connections. And in fact, they've done studies, fMRI studies that have shown that this makes the connections. The taxi driver study, people have heard about this, so let's go to that. The London taxi driver, we just came from London yes. for our book tour, and, uh, and I can understand why. It makes why. more sense. It now. makes more sense. Yes. Not in the, world, in, the, in the realm of GPS anymore, but <laughs> a while ago, if you needed a, a, license, a um, taxi license, you had to memorize all the streets in London. My goodness. Wow. So the average person doing this study was 50 something, so not a young person. And they all did it. They did studies, volumetric studies, volume of the hippocampus, the memory centers, before they started studying and after. The brain had actually grown after this. Grown in actual in volume. volume. In, in volume. a relatively mm-hmm. short period of in time. In a very, very short period. So that tells you that your brain is active at any age and can grow connections. Of course, the cells didn't grow, although now we know that even they grow to some extent, especially with exercise, with neurotrophic factors mm-hmm. and all that. You, you've done a lot of good to your brain with, with exercise. Yeah, I've probably damaged it in many other ways. But <laughs> <laughs> no, there's reserve. There's plenty yeah. of reserve. But but those connections grow, and we see it in, by volume. Mm-hmm. Uh, so it's wonderful. So it's a book of hope, you know, um, that you can do something. And it's not even about Alzheimer's. Now, here's a uh, talk about uh, um, uh, the dropping ball. It's, it's about avoiding Alzheimer's. It's about resilient, fulfilled, vibrant brain activity laid into your 80s, 90s, and beyond. Using the full potential of the brain. Yeah. Right. So when you begin this journey 15 some odd years ago, uh, I would imagine, you know, like you kind of alluded to earlier, your colleagues are like, this is career suicide. What are you doing? You're going to start looking at, uh, you know, lifestyle medicine for this. And, and so I think it, it would make sense to kind of explain or at least <clears throat> talk through some of the myths and the misconceptions about this disease, <clears throat> particularly this notion that it's a purely genetic mm-hmm. situation. Like if you have the gene, this is what's going to happen and right. there's nothing you can do about it. Right. Um, that has been the misunderstanding for such a long time. And, uh, you know, um, there are, there are a few genes in Alzheimer's disease, um, maybe less than 5% mm-hmm. of the genes that, you know, completely determine uh, whether somebody gets Alzheimer's or not. As a matter of fact, if you have those genes, you're definitely going to get it. Um, but even for those, um, you can push it off for a very long time. For the rest of them, for, you know, the 95 plus percent of the genotypes, it's, it's quite clear that what you do in your life, the type of food that you eat, whether you exercise or not, or the level of stress that you have, determine whether you're going to get the disease in your early 60s or in your late 90s. Right. 
So this, the, as I understand it, this this gene, the primary gene, is the APO four uh, yes. E four. Yes. Right? Yes. E four. Yes. Right. And uh, and this can be expressed in a variety of ways. Like you either you have it as like a recessive allele, right, or you have it as uh, like I don't know how you describe dominant this, but dominant. Right. Yes. And then if you have it like. What is it? Twice over? How did you describe that? Yeah, if you like if you get a certain alleles from your mom and dad, right. which is actually rare, two percent of people, your risk goes up twenty fold. Mm-hmm. But even of those that have the two alleles, only fifty percent of them get the Alzheimer's. Mm-hmm. So yeah, it increases your risk, but it doesn't mean it's 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 destiny. Definitely, yeah. Genes in Alzheimer's do not make destiny. So uh, Aisha was talking about the five percent that are very heavily driven. But the other 90 or 90 plus percent are, we know now there are like 30 genes, we'll probably identify further, that increase your risk of uh, Alzheimer's and those, plus APOE4. Now, what are these genes, these other genes, for the ones that we think we can reverse? Now we know that a proportion of them are uh, genes with vascular response. Others are immune response. Others are garbage disposable, meaning that as you gauge, you, you accumulate this garbage in the cells and how well does, is your garbage disposal. And then the APOE4 is lipid and inflammation. So they're lifestyle genes. Mm-hmm. So these genes give you a range of anywhere between 10 to 30 years. What you do in life determ- decide, determines if you're going to get it early on or as late as 90 or beyond. Mm-hmm. Right, so, so the magnitude of how these genes are expressed is contingent upon what you're eating and how you're moving and how you're living your life. Completely, Absolutely. right? Completely. And and what's interesting, let's let's get into like the contributing factors before we get into the solution, because you kind of broke this down into four categories. We have inflammation, we have oxidation, we have glucose deregulation, and we have lipid dysregulation. Mm-hmm. Right. So these are the four main things that mm-hmm. are driving uh, the expression of this. Absolutely, absolutely. So when we're talking about inflammation, let's just go through these, like seriatim, if we could quickly, and explain what these mean. Yeah, so inflammation is a normal part of the body. Yes, it's a constant process that goes on, and we have mechanisms in place that get rid of them in Alzheimer's disease and so many other diseases. And that actually shows us the, the commonality between right. you know degenerative diseases of the brain and vascular diseases of the brain and the body. Right, because, uh, sorry, I don't mean to interrupt. Not I, at I, all, please, please. If you could indulge me. Yeah, what's amazing is how much, so much of this tracks what we know about heart disease and diabetes. Like when we're looking at chronic inflammation and the incidence of yeah. these diseases, it's like completely overlaps Absolutely. in the Venn diagram with what you guys are talking completely. about with the brain. And, and, and that is something that we have been focusing on, upon. And it, it was almost a eureka moment for us. I mean, we knew it, but the fact that, you know, the processes that are going on in the brain goes on in the body as well. For such a long time, People always, people and scientists specifically, always thought that the brain was a black box. It was a separate organ that had a completely different type of physiology. And, you know, the, the things that affected the heart, say, for example, the kidneys, the lungs, couldn't affect the brain. But that's not true. It's the same process. We talked about inflammation. You know, there are certain mechanisms that are not working very well and inflammation builds and that's how it starts destroying the brain structure, whether it's the cells, the connections, the supporting structures of the brain. And and the inflammation is actually associated with the other processes, with glucose dysregulation, which is essentially the glucose not being able to be used properly by the cells. Lipid dysregulation, where the proper fat cells that create and metabolize cells, they stop working. And then, um, you know, all of them together start, you know, depositing the bad proteins, which is essentially what right. all the sciences have been focusing on, but not looking at the upstream processes. Yeah, yeah. so it's, it's almost like all these paths lead to one point, mm-hmm. the amyloid, which actually starts 20 years, 10 years before. And then everybody just focuses on that end point. Uh, we, we've made an animation, hopefully coming out soon. It's a, it's a, it's a little boat. You're in your 30s. In your 30s, you start having some blood pressure. So, so the boat is an analogy of a person. Mm-hmm. Or, or the brain. Yes, or the and brain. And then there's yeah. a little hole in the boat. And then there's inflammation because of overwhelming uh, bad food and things of that nature. So that's a crack in the boat. And then oxidative byproducts because of uh, the, the fact that you had certain trauma or because of head trauma or other things. And so by, by 50 uh, or 40s, the amyloid, which is water, starts seeping in. 
and the holes are accumulating because of all these other things. And then about 60 or 65, the person is sitting on, uh, on a boat and they feel the water. But the boat's already one third full of water. Uh -huh. And for the last 30 years, all we've been doing, billions of dollars, taking a little cup, trying to get rid of water. Uh -huh. You could get rid of all of the water, but if you don't address the inflammation, the crack, if you don't address the glucose dysregulation, the, the boat's still going to uh, sink. That's the, the, the mentality, the, the concept is wrong because we're, we're looking at it completely in the wrong end should be looked at at the lifestyle side. Right, and not only that, not even really looking at it or addressing it until the boat's half full, right? Exactly. Of water, exactly. right? Like, exactly. oh, well, now that you have this thing, it's like, well, actually, this has been building for the last, you know, 20, 20 years. years. Exactly. Right? You know? Exactly. And it's not any one of these four factors. I mean, these are all interrelated. I mean, if you, if you are chronically inflamed, then you're going to have problems with oxidation and free radicals. Absolutely. And, you know, glucose deregulation leads to insulin resistance. These are, these are all related to the foods that we're eating and how we're living our lives and Completely. how we're sleeping or not sleeping yes. and the stress and all of that plays into that. And these are the same four factors that are contributing to diabetes and, and heart disease. Absolutely. And to make it a little anticlimactic, take the power away from the book. Whatever you knew about heart disease, apply it to brain disease. Right, because when, you're talking, about, when you're talking about amyloid, you're talking about the plaques that the amyloids create in Correct. the brain, right? And so... I mean, is it fair to draw an analogy to the plaques that are in our arterial system with heart disease? Is there, is there a rationale in comparing those two, or is it completely a different It's a thing? different kind of plaque. Mm -hmm. uh, amyloid, although you have amyloidosis and other diseases that happen systematically as well, but the amyloid in the brain is a little different. But, but, at the, but in reality, it's the same process. The body is overwhelmed because of inflammation, because of oxidation and everything else, so it actually starts making bad proteins. Simply, uh, a bad point protein in one place is tau, in another place is synuclein, in another place is amyloid, but it's because it's been overwhelmed by inflammation, glucose dysregulation, lipid dysregulation. It's time for us to just say, the brain is complex, great, but the mechanisms are the same. Mm -hmm. But just much, so much more. I mean, this little three pound organ, 25% uses 25% of the body's energy. Of course, it's going to be overwhelmed more. It makes it one of the most susceptible organs in the body, as well as the most resilient one because of its activity, right. because it's always trying to consume so much energy. So whatever we do, we kind of joke about it in our talks with say, sorry, cardiologist, the heart is there to support the brain, but <laughs> it, it is so whatever uh -huh. we do to it actually affects it first and then the rest of the body. Right. Yes. And, but in the same way that, that a cardiologist is, is sort of focused on stents and bypass, they're looking at the energy product of this disease yeah. in your field it's all about amyloid and how do we get rid of this stuff or yes. as opposed to looking at the factors that are contributing to the production of it in the first place Absolutely. we think that actually even exponentially more for the brain if you take care of your brain you've taken care of all the body because now uh, this this thing that we're trying to create living mind kind it's about the mind mindful living and uh, so this affects the totality of your body. For brain, it's something more than that because you, here you have emotions as well. You have motivation, you have all this. So the, one of the elements of our book is not just saying this is bad and this is good, but where we have failed people is we just throw it at them without giving them the tools of how to apply it to their life. Mm -hmm. So mindful living is, is, uh, is the unique thing about our book, uh, more than even the science. And it's a vicious cycle. If you feel good, you know, based on the, the good neurochemicals being produced appropriately, if you take care of your brain and if you have a healthy mind, that um, owning that um, mindfulness in your life and applying it on a regular basis can help you take better care of yourself. So there you go. You have a healthy brain. You have the tools to take care of your heart and the rest of your body. Right, and everything follows Absolutely. from that, uh, right? Depression. Recently, papers came, several. I mean, the, whenever, as a science, we don't say paper came. A paper means nothing. <laughs> it has to be multiple and validated. Um, otherwise, you, every day you say, science says this. Who is this Mr. Science that mm -hmm. keeps saying these things? That would, you got to give me more than that. <laughs> but lots of papers say that one of the major causes of depression, inflammation. Yeah. yeah. So it keeps coming back. 
yet we keep slipping. I call it logic slip. Mm -hmm. And a lot of times when you have debates, you keep building these logical sequence and you work past the the fallacies and everything, and then it slips again. Mm -hmm. That's what's happening in nutrition and lifestyle. and, and, And you make the case. I mean, the case for diet has been made over and over again, and then all of a sudden slip again. Now we know inflammation and all these things actually even affect the depression, anxiety, uh, everything, all of these diseases. Right. You can't you can't extract one thing from the other, right? And it seems like uh, the the advent of functional medicine, lifestyle medicine, is is growing, and people are starting to embrace this idea that it's not just one treatment protocol mm-hmm. that we have to kind of look at a person in a holistic way and, and mm-hmm. you know treat them. Um, you know, all the way down to, you know, how they, how they interact with their family members and at work and what's their relationship with their boss. And, you know, all of that stuff is crucial, right. To kind of solving this problem. Well, let's talk a little bit about the path forward in terms of prevention and reversal. Like you break this down into five categories, right? Nutrition, exercise, unwind, restore, and optimize. So maybe we can spend a little bit more time in in, in, in unpacking the nutrition part of this in, uh, in detail. Yeah, absolutely. Um, it's um, it's been quite clear, you know, from studies coming from the Adventist Health Study and the, from the Women's Health Initiative, and you know, decades of data that show that a whole food, which is unprocessed, plant based diet, low mm-hmm. in sugar, seems to be the best dietary pattern for for the brain. And it affects all those processes that we just talked about, lowering inflammation, uh, managing uh, glucose metabolism, managing lipid metabolism, providing the best source of macro and micronutrients for the brain to thrive, to grow, mm-hmm. to heal itself. And you know, study after study um, shows the same thing over and over again. And by just looking at populations, you know, the seven-day Adventist population, um, you rarely see dementia and the ones that do have dementia either have it very late in life or they have had other uncontrolled risk factors in their life and so the idea of nutrition you know we try not to tell people to become vegetarians in the in the clinic and that it doesn't work that way and especially for people who have not been vegetarians throughout their lives um not just going to hit them with that right over no, the head right when they walk in. It doesn't work that no. way. And, <laughs> no, I, think, no. and as th- I think as, as scientists and as doctors, we failed over and over again because we have this um, cookie cutter approach for everybody. Just mm-hmm. do what I just do this and you'll become better. It doesn't work that way. It has to be tailored according to their resources, to their likes and dislikes, to what they can own at that moment in their life and move forward with it. So it's making small incremental changes on a daily basis. Um, we One of the talks we gave to one of the uh, African-American churches, afterwards they invited us, and it was all women, of course, uh, and wonderful, and said, Dr. Shares, I, it was a wonderful talk. Yeah, we love you very much. We love you so much, but if you expect us to go vegan overnight, it's not going to happen. I said, no, 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 that's not the aim. The aim is to work towards. So in the book we said WTE, WTI work towards eliminating, work towards increasing. It's small incremental changes. And and the the most interesting thing is in in that research project that I conducted in the California teacher study, we we essentially created a statistics to look at adherence levels to a plant based diet. And every incremental change, every increase in the score of adherence to the best diet lowered risk of stroke, lowered mm. risk of brain diseases. And, you know, to tell people that even if you replace, you know, an unhealthy meal with a small salad or, or just replacing small, making small changes actually makes a big difference. And we've seen that in the clinic. And I think that's, that's empowering. At the core of this is motivation. And the word motivation is, is a terrible word. And my daughter reminded us how terrible it yeah. was. My 10 year old daughter, or they're both my son is fairly driven. He's 12 years old. And he, she came to us, you know, and he, she's actually very good. She's 10 years old. She's in ninth grade. And, 
she said um, well, hold on she's in ninth grade well, the, the, she's well, 10 years old and in ninth grade and and our son is already yeah <laughs> no but but all right but she comes and says, i gotta know more about that but go ahead <laughs> said mom is all motivated and you're motivated and alex is motivated so what's going I, on why I am i not feel motivated motivated yeah she, said, she told us I said, so I realized, wait a second, what is this motivation thing? What, what? So, because we throw it at children and they, if they don't own this big monosyllabic thing, like as if, uh, you know, one of those movies where you're, you're charging. Or you're Tony Robbins. Or yeah, like exactly. Yeah. Then you're not doing the right thing. There's something wrong with you. I said, there's no motivation. Motivation is small increments of success in a direction that you've set. That incidentally, your brain, and your brain always this, does this. I'll give you a perfect example of that. Uh, you have a blind spot. We can do experiment and we can figure out where your blind spot is. Mm-hmm. Your brain fills in that space. And hundreds of experiments like that where your brain fills in information, fills in color, fills in, in knowledge. Uh, when somebody's drunk, they confabulate. People say, oh, he's lying. No, your brain is forced to create a story. So this filling in is a natural part of human brain to make itself comfortable so when you have a series of successes in a direction with a vector with a purpose 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 is the key your brain creates an emotion to it Mm -hmm. and that emotion has a direction that's motivation so we just operationalize motivation and so if you want to change people's behavior you don't just throw it at them in fact the reason that most of healthcare is a failure because it's sick care in medicine, we don't learn behavioral modification at all. Four years of college, highly driven people whose mom or dad told them to become a doctor. I've just offended a bunch yeah. of people, but for, for a large <laughs> percentage. Pretty much yeah. true for a lot yeah. of people. Exactly. And then so it's like study, study biochemistry, this and this, but nothing about lifestyle and all this. And then you have or understanding human behavior and how to relate to another human being. No, too. because they're high, hyper driven people. The rest of the people, you know, medical school, worse. So it's just Mm -hmm. biochemistry, anatomy, histology, memorization. Then four years of residency. My gosh, that was until recently, that was just um, uh, going through, uh, you know, military school. Mm -hmm. So that's 12 years. And then fellowship. So you come out as a leader now. You're a doctor. Patients come to you. And by the way, 50% of your pay is going to be how to train them, uh, train the patient or teach the patient about lifestyle. Never happens. You don't know. So what do you do? You, at the door, you've done the check, you've done the knee thing, you've said... The, and, and it's how healthcare reimburses you. They reimburse right. you more on the notes and your examination and, what, five minutes of counseling? Yeah. Not and then at the, door, at the door, you say, by the way, eat healthy. And most of the doctors don't know about what that means, so they've Googled, like everybody else. So it's either this gimmick or that gimmick. Ketogenic diet or paleo and mm-hmm. things like that. And then the person is left at the door, at, 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 in the clinic, lost. So they, they look at this. This is incredible. If I, I, I want to actually create controversy so that there's conversation. Controversy is great. Conversation. Um, what happens is the patient's left. I have blood pressure. I have diabetes. And I know that it's related to my diet. And he said, I have to eat healthy. There's no information. Forget about information. Forget about behavior. They give up on it. Not only do they give up on that, they also give up on their medicines. Mm. You've done double damage. It's time to change the conversation towards how you truly empower patients. You go to their communities or in the clinic, give them one behavior. We give one behavior. Yeah. We know what sugar is. Cut your sugar. We know what saturated fat is. You're eating this much cheese for in a week? How about here's a plant-based cheese that you can get from this place. Just change that for a week. Right, something very specific and and doable that they can that they can master or that they can work on. Exactly, something to check off on a regular basis so that it becomes a deep bound habit, and they feel success in doing it, and they don't have to think about it. Right, and that's when you introduce the next step. Yeah, just uh, get almond milk, not regular milk or whatever. Just make that one change. One change. You know, getting back to your earlier point, it's it's a systemic problem. I mean, these doctors are well intentioned. You know, whether they understand nutrition or not, like Absolutely. everybody wants to help their patients. They're yes. under their own pressures, right? They got to move on to the next person. Mm-hmm. And you hear time and time again, well, I could tell them to do this or that, but they're not going to do it, right? And there, there's sort of a pessimism, I think, and a condescension that's built into that. But there's also a truth, right? Because if they just tell them to do something, but there's no accountability and there's no community and there's no follow up and there's no structure in place, 
where, you know, that, that doctor's office can reach out and check on that person, or they're supposed to come back and there's a program that they can, where they have support for making this change. You know, if that's not available, then they're right. Like just telling them to do that thing is Mm -hmm. probably not going to work. So it's bigger than just get involved in the community. It's sort of like, well, how do we create a system where the doctors can be incentivized and, and taken care of for taking that, you know, step and making that effort? Absolutely. That, you, you hit it right on. Yeah. Incentivized. I mean, they have to make a living. And not only forget about living, the doctors are willing to sacrifice their money, their time. But there has to be time allotted and a system created that where even the doctors see their behavior coming to a success so the doctors are motivated so uh, the first step in everything is conversation i think uh, one of the most important things we can do and it started it has started started, is to say the way we're doing medicine right now is not health care it is important sick care is important when a person comes with an infection they need a medicine when a person comes with a blood pressure of 200 you're not going to say go eat you know this that's Mm -hmm. that's a long-term thing you have to take your medicine. That's sick care. It's important. But there's another side, which is health care, which has to be incentivized. There has to be a mechanism. People can't just rely on goodwill where I'm going to go at nights to the clinics or this or that or to churches. There has to be a system created where we can prevent. But you know what? That system, when it's created, will reduce the cost of health care by 80 to 90% by itself. That's a pretty staggering statistic. Yeah. So we just have to make the choice as a, as a society. Uh, and even the choice, you know, we get caught up in the po- politics of right, left. No, once there's enough information that overwhelms and, and, and everybody sees the benefit in this for their kids. I mean, we don't, well, this book is not about just Alzheimer's end of life. I mean, our kids are overwhelmed by sugar. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And then we tell them they have ADHD. Well, they might, but a great proportion just have a lot of sugar. <laughs> yeah, there's no question about yeah. that. And, and also, you know, I want to get back to the nutrition piece in a minute. But, you know, what I took away from it is that it's a book about how to live your life now so that you don't have to deal with this. When, Like if you're you could read this book as a 20 year old and say, well, I want I want to take care of my brain and this is the way to do it. Because those amyloids and all this sort of stuff that goes into creating, you know, the dementia and the Alzheimer's, this is going on all the time, right? Yeah. So it doesn't just suddenly strike you at age 65. Like, it's just like heart disease, like you're working on this your whole life and mm-hmm. it has to do with the diet and the lifestyle. Yeah, absolutely. absolutely. So on the nutrition piece, so as just so we're totally clear, as scientists who have, uh, you know, studied this disease for a long time and treated a lot of people, you're sold on the whole food plant-based diet. This is the, this is the way to go. Absolutely. Yes. As a scientist, we say to the best of our knowledge today, mm-hmm. I, I, that to me is the most powerful, the most humble statement in English language. I think forced certainty is the cause of a lot of our conflicts. Science is open to change. I mean, tomorrow, if they say, if you eat a steak, I'm not going to because of other reasons, but I would say, okay, it, it should. I doubt that it's going to come, come. but to that, right now, the data is just overwhelming. Mm-hmm. Um, and uh, a lot of times in discussions, when any discussion, they fail you by, by falsely holding you to absolutes, saying, but there's not cause and effect. Science cannot create cause and effect. Mm -hmm. It can create strong correlations, very strong. Even now, we can't create cause and effect with cigarettes because you can always talk your way out of it, you know, even if you give people, even if Mm -hmm. it was ethical. But there's a tremendous amount of data that a whole food plant-based diet is overwhelmingly protective. Yeah. Is there any uh, positive benefit with respect to brain health for, is there any argument that there's something healthy about eating meat when it comes to cognitive health? Like is, go go ahead, sorry. So nutrition science is, um, you know, has its flaws. Um, The way we're recording diet right now is through food frequency questionnaires or diet, uh, food diaries and things of that nature. Um, And, um, you know, it has its strengths when you look at the different components of meat, the saturated fats and the animal proteins, you know, whether it's animal studies or human studies, they're not good. 
I mean, the data over and over comes back and shows us that saturated fat actually causes those plaques in the arteries in the brain that supply oxygen and nutrition to the different areas of the brain and they get clogged when saturated fat is very high in your diet. Plus inflammation and everything else. Plus inflammation, plus affecting glucose metabolism as well. And on the contrary, so in comparison to, you know, other types of fats such as polyunsaturated fats and monounsaturated, they're actually beneficial. The most important element of the Mediterranean diet that everybody's been talking about for heart health and for brain health are those, you know, poly and monounsaturated fats, and they come from plants. So, you know, when you look at different, um, different comparisons of whether they're the types of fats that you eat or the antioxidants that you get from plants, it's, it's quite clear. And, you know, when you look at meat, I mean, other than fat and protein, it doesn't have anything else. It doesn't have any fiber. And some of the minerals that are there, they're just minimal. So you get more benefit from eating a whole food plant-based diet. The two things that they always talk about is protein mm -hmm. and uh, how about lean meat? Okay, so uh, these are oxymorons, lean meat, because it's the fat not that you see and you strip away. The cells in their cell wall have these kind of saturated fats. That's the component that we're talking about. So when they say chicken is lean meat, well, first of all, we're eating three times more chicken than anything else, actually much more. So therefore, it's by the volume. source of cholesterol yeah, in ch our diet. Chicken's the big problem. Yeah. It is, it is. But at the same time, the fat is not what you see as white streaks. Mm -hmm. It's what's in the cell walls. Exactly. The cell wall structure is different. So that's one thing. The second thing is protein. It's as if plants don't have protein. The protein, the majority of protein we get is not in the form of muscle. The majority of protein we get is in the ribosomes and proteins within the cells. So to say that plants have, don't have protein is, is not understanding the mechanism of the cell. So we have plenty of protein and, uh, within the cell, and then we have other plants that have protein even outside, you know, the, like beans and others. So those are the two uh, um, contradictory things. The one thing though that we always talk about that we, they've seen in vegans is lack of B12. B12 and the way it's bound to meat and, he, you know, it's actually much more bioavailable in the meat form than it is in the plant mm -hmm. form. Right. So anybody who's purely vegan should definitely supplement themselves with B12. Um, and then what we say is along with B12, everybody, not just vegans, and uh, DHA and omega-3 should be because the synergy between B12 and, and uh, omega and B, uh, DHA seems to be pretty powerful, more uh, we'll be coming out on that. We're big time about synergy of vitamins, not singularity. In other words, like taking those together to Correct. increase the bioavailability of Cor the B12? Correct. Exactly. Correct. exactly. Yeah, exactly. I haven't heard that before. Yeah, not so much that bioavailability, but they seem to work together more in I the see. body. Uh -huh. um, and, and many studies, we did four reviews, mm -hmm. which is these collecting all the papers and then coming out with what those said, so which is the hot, most painful kind of research. And, and on nutrition and Parkinson's, yes. nutrition and stroke, and nutrition and dementia. And the thing that stood out the most was synergy. Absolutely. So these micronutrients, whether they're vitamins or minerals, they don't work um, alone. Um, you know, it's, it's actually the combination and the levels of the different kinds of micronutrients that matter and they synergize each other's availability. So, and that makes sense. And that's why, you know, hundreds of studies on say for example vitamin e and brain health or vitamin c and alzheimer's or parkinson's disease have come back with no results with no particular correlation and effect but and and when you eat it in a whole form when you eat it in a you know plant form all of these micronutrients are well balanced and they're bound to other macronutrients they're bound to the fiber as well which increases their bioavailability one of the things that you hear is is that uh, you need healthy fats for brain health. Like the brain needs good fats, right? So that's true, correct? Mm -hmm. So yes. when we're talking about healthy fats, what are those healthy fats? What are the, you know, we talked a little bit about saturated fat and animal fat, but like how do we parse the difference between a healthy fat and an unhealthy fat? We say focusing too much on fat or one food product is uh, I'm just... I'm getting reductionist yeah. now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yes, exactly. Yeah. But I mean, that's what yeah. you hear. You're like, oh, if you... Like, right. I've heard that many times, like, oh, to combat Alzheimer's or if you don't want to get dementia, like, you have to make sure you're getting enough of your omega-3s and mm -hmm. your healthy fats in your diet. Right. I think, I think just focusing on eating um, 
unprocessed whole foods, mostly plants is the best way to go about it because you get your protein, you get your carbohydrates, you get mm -hmm. the best types of fat by just eating those normal foods. If we focus too much on one micronutrient and one macronutrient, it, it doesn't, it doesn't eat your do olives, any, any eat good. your avocados yeah. and you got your fats. You eat, eat some you're nuts good. here and there and you're, you're fine. Yeah. There was much ado about coconut oil recently and the impact on brain health. And you, you were pretty unequivocal in your book about that. <laughs> and and uh, you wanted to, uh, we've been attacked by, it seems to be clans. Of, yeah, there's the, the people, are people are very, very passionate. No, there's, there's passionate. certain things that people get really, yes. get very really passionate, get very passionate about. Coconut was one of them we learned very early. Well, it goes back and forth on coconut oil too, but go ahead. Sorry. Right. No, it, it's interesting um, because, you know, all of this started with, with one study and from Not study. one person, person. <laughs> one person giving coconut oil to her husband who had Alzheimer's disease. So no, supposedly had Alzheimer's. Supposedly had Alzheimer's disease and supposedly got better. But then we found out later that he got worse later as well. So we don't know whether it was coconut oil or whatever it so was. So these guys like patient zero, like for this whole story? Yeah. Like, the whole story. That's like a sociological experiment. Like how did that happen? It, it happens because people are looking for anecdotes and yeah. fallacies. So why are we keep, why do we keep struggling? Because we're, we're, our brain is designed to hear stories. And if somebody tells a good story, that's more powerful than a thousand studies. Mm -hmm. And because the studies don't have stories in them and they're not associated with faces. Yes. Maybe they you know, should. You, yeah, yeah, maybe they should. should do if, a little storytelling in, in JAMA, right? <laughs> yes. Probably. Or make a case <laughs> series. A yeah. um, I, think, I think that would that would actually sit with the population much better. But it's just, you know, you pointed it out. Mm -hmm. When you, like we're storytellers, when you don't associate a cause and an effect with a person or with a, a, a particular situation, it's very difficult to see it. I mean, the thousands of people that have been studied and you have these phenomenal results, they don't have any faces, they're just numbers and people don't see themselves be a part of that. Yeah, this, 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 so this study, although there's, there were some data, so let's just talk about the science yeah. of the um, uh, coconut oil. Um, uh, medium chain fatty acids mm -hmm. and coconut uh, um, oil has been studied in many things, and there's some 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 signals that people get here and there. Um, uh, there's some evidence, to the best of our knowledge today, that the medium chain part, which is about eighty eight percent of the total fat, mm -hmm. the other ninety percent is ninety to ninety two percent is uh, saturated fat. But the medium chain, when people have looked at that, seems to have some benefit. And, and even that has to be reproduced and shown. So we're okay with that. I mean, that's, we, have no, we have no skin in the game on one side or the other. What works? And so what we say is, to the best of our knowledge today, with the data, true data, there doesn't seem to be a strong relation between uh, coconut oil and, uh, and, and brain health. Mm -hmm. The medium chain part, there seems to be some, what we say, qualitative and further study that needs to be done, and that, that is being done. And we welcome that. But to extrapolate from one case and from few studies to say that it's beneficial for your, heart, for your brain, don't you think somebody would have shown those cases in a much better way? They would have made millions by now. Yeah, but that would require us to actually read, yes. right? Yeah. We don't want to do that. No, Dean. no, 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 no. Um, a lot of the, it seemed that a lot of the research that, that, you know, you kind of plow through in the book and has kind of informed your, your, you know, your protocols. Some of it comes from looking at the Mediterranean diet, right. Versus like a whole food plant-based mm -hmm. diet. And then probably because there's just been more studies on that. Exactly. I don't know. Right. Um, so how does that play out in terms of meat intake and, and also, you know, things like olive oil, processed vegetable oils, well, it actually has, coconut oil. It actually has helped us. It has actually helped us understand the nuances of plant-based diet and its benefit mm -hmm. because <clears throat> the way the dietary um, scoring system, uh, for the lack of a better term, is structured is, you know, you, you get positive um, scores for a plant-based diet. And you get negative scores for sugar, meat, and dairy, and things of that nature. Mm -hmm. So the higher you go on that scale means the more adherent you are to a whole food plant-based diet. But because this um, 
this Mediterranean diet was structured and it was given a label and it was started in an area where people had the least amount of cardiovascular disease. It just stuck that way. Mm -hmm. um, but we now know that, you know, different scientists and different um, doctors at different uh, universities have actually come up with a better definition of dietary patterns and their different statistical processes like factor analysis to see, you know, what dietary pattern stands out in the healthiest population. And um, we, we see this, uh, this picture being translated uh, in different populations that a plant-based diet seems to be the healthiest. And the factor analysis is, is looking at what component of this thing yes. is most beneficial. And it's not the fish. Right. Mm -hmm. It's the plants. <clears throat> right. Over and over again. It's the beans. It's that, that component. So even though it's not completely, uh, a, a, let's say, plant-based diet, but we can actually distill because these are large studies, 144,000, yes. you know, um, we can, it's large enough. We can actually then break it down into what component of the diet will had the greatest benefit because this group ate more of this versus this. Mm -hmm. So we now have enough data from all these big studies to strongly consistently say that it's the plant-based component of even of the Mediterranean that's most, most beneficial. That's interesting. But by far and away, the large culprit here is sugar. Correct. Correct. Um, we even us. I mean, uh, uh, meat is bad. Saturated fat is bad. Um, let me actually take a step back. So let's get back to the disease, diseases of the brain. Um, when it comes to stroke, it's fairly well known. Stroke is vascular. So it's going to be mostly driven by saturated fat and, and sugar then. For Alzheimer's, it's a, it's, it's a catch-all category. In a few years, we'll realize that there are many types of Alzheimer's. Those that come to it from vascular side, those that come to it from inflammatory side, those that come from it from other sides. The football players that have been hit multiple times mm -hmm. with trauma. Right. That's more inflammation versus those who have lipid dysregulation. So... To, to talk about that, there are those that are more driven by sugar and glucose dysregulation, but there are others, especially the ones with ApoE4 that we believe that are driven by sugar and everything and inflammation, but, but dominant feature is fat and saturated fat. So it depends which direction. And I say, since we don't know that yet, although we can get a good picture of it, especially in our clinic and others, and others uh, it, it would behoove us to kind of limit all of those bad things you know, sugar and mm -hmm. saturated fat and steps. Right. What about gluten? I'll leave that to you. <laughs> yeah. No, there, was there wasn't. One that... there, but it didn't seem like, was it, it, I didn't see it in the book. Did you guys no. make a decision to not address that? Oh, well, because there really isn't any data that supports the idea that gluten is, uh, you know, causes harm to the brain. There's, you know, probably one or two percent of the population that are sensitive to gluten and they have specific allergies. Right. But and, for, and that creates inflammation. It creates right. inflammation and it actually has other repercussions in the body, gut health and skin health and musculoskeletal issues as well. So it's a constellation of problems that people suffer from to, for gluten to just affect the brain. There's really no, there's no data that supports that. And, um, you know, there have been some authors that have actually made a lot of fortune pushing the idea hmm. that gluten's bad for you and that you have to stay away from it and that you just have to eat a lot of fat and protein. And that's just not true. Yeah. The, the important thing is here is I always say it's not the, the struggles we have as humanity is not truth. Everybody has their truth. It's the weight of the truth. Mm -hmm. If somebody overstates a weight <clears throat> of a truth, it, they're creating fallacy. If they're understating, it's creating fallacy. Is gluten bad for people who have celiac disease? Absolutely. They should avoid it. Is gluten bad for another percentage, which we we still don't fully know? I mean, look at this. We, we don't know something fully, yet we're making these huge public health uh, actions. And I'll tell you where the public health component comes in. Um, let's say that that other group beyond celiac disease is at 3%. We don't even know that. Let's say if it's that bad for them, they should be studied, identified, and right. they should avoid it. But to say that gluten is bad, which actually what's now the common law or, or language out there, means that 90% or more have to avoid gluten, which means that with that comes what? They have to avoid, because we don't have a good way of doing that. So it's we, a blunt, we mechanism. blunt mechanism. We give up on all whole grains. Whole grains. Yeah. So look at weight of truth. We, this 3% benefited. 
the three percent that was supposedly gluten sensitive, but the ninety five percent or ninety whatever percent that would have benefited from a whole wheat, and 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 you know, they are going to suffer because of because of overgeneralization of 3%. Yeah, yeah. That's a common problem in science. Yeah, no, I get that. I get that. And I think it gets even more complicated because we've hybridized our wheat and most of the wheat is, it's so stripped of any of its nutri- nutritional Absolutely. value anyway and it ends up in these packaged foods. I mean, I just know if if I eat like crappy pizza crust like my eyes get puffy and mm. like i feel terrible like yes, i yeah. i'm like that's not good for me like yes. I, my research is done like i know like yeah. i don't know where i fall in the spectrum of gluten sensitivity but i can tell you straight up that it's creating an inflammatory response mm. in my body and that can't be good and i feel terrible absolutely, absolutely. I, mean, and I and then i keep eating it <laughs> you know, like so it's like it, it's like well what is in our wheat and is it the gluten or is it something else about like how we've you know kind of you know hybridized yeah. these foods that are staples because at its core of course whole grains are great and now it's almost like if you say well you should eat whole grains people are like oh whole grain like they're afraid of whole grains yeah, yeah. so so that three percent four percent five percent let's say is dictating health for the 90 percent uh, that would have benefited from whole grain i mean if we give up fats saturated fats and especially uh, let's say fats sugars and then grains as well what are we going to eat Right, people throw up their hands; they get despondent. Yeah, and, and oh, and that's what I was getting to. One of the things that, not to be a conspiracy theorist or anything like that, one of the ways you fail people is by throwing so much information, false, and and play with the weights of truth that people just finally give up and say, "I'm going to do whatever I have to," mm-hmm. and we can't afford that. So you operate with what you know to the best of our knowledge, and say, "I'm fully on board to study coconut oil." But am I going to make public health decisions for general population on that? No, not yet. I'm fully on board to studying gluten. Absolutely. Are we at the apex, at the full knowledge of all of nutrition? Not Not even close. Not Not at all. But what do we make public policy on is with the best data we have right now. Otherwise, you're going to be all over the place and people give up. and And we know that diet kills and diet saves and we so we have to operate with what we know and leave the rest open to to research on the subject of research and diet uh what is your perspective on the ketogenic diet because this is getting a lot of attention and a lot of press and there's a lot of talk about the impact of being in ketosis in terms of disease prevention and reversal etc so like what do you know about it what is your understanding of it what's your perspective so the process of ketosis is essentially a, um, a period of starvation for the body and for creating um, alternative fuels that the body can use. And it has been studied, specifically we'll talk about the brain diseases, you know, for certain um, epilepsy diseases of, uh, right. of children. Not, not all epis- epilepsy. Not, there's certain, certain epilepsies mm-hmm. and it, it's helpful. It actually makes them have less seizures and it makes them function better in their lives. But um, usually it's a very short period, a very quick, blunt method of controlling seizures in that population. Beyond that, ketosis hasn't been studied in any other disease and it hasn't really generated, you know, a large amount of evidence for us to apply it in public health. Um, for individuals with Alzheimer's disease or cognitive impairment, um, you know, the, the, the studies that have actually shown that ketosis or a ketogenic diet um, is, you know, showing some benefit, they were done in a very small population and the amount of ketosis wasn't measured well and it was studied for a very short period of time. It makes sense when you look at the cellular structure for um, the ketone bodies to provide fuel for cells that can't use glucose anymore for advanced mm. stages of the disease because the cell structure has been, you know, has been destroyed and there's been a lot of inflammation and dysregulation going on. However, to use this particular technique or this approach for a long term 
I mean, we know that down the road they will have plaques in their arteries if they keep up the ketogenic diet. They will have glucose dysregulation. They will have lipid dysregulation. All these processes that we just talked about, and it causes a lot more inflammation. So it doesn't make sense that this diet would actually work long term. Um, do people feel good on, uh, using it initially? Absolutely. And I'll tell you why. And do people lose weight? Absolutely. Because if you're going to stay away from carbs, let's say, um, you hold about two to three pounds or more of carbs in your muscles. And as that gets burned away, used, and the water that's connected to it, anywhere between six to 10 to 12 pounds of weight is lost. So, wow, I just lost weight. Absolutely, great. Why do you feel good? Because here's a cell that needs glucose, it needs energy. I mean, we, we talked about how much energy it needs. The usual mechanism or the usual energy source is glucose, the most effective way, the, the, the functional mm -hmm. energy source. Mm -hmm. But in order for glucose to get in, it needs receptors. It's, not, it's a very fickle uh, process. It has to find the receptor. And if there's too much sugar in the body, what happens is the cell internalizes the receptor because it's shocked. So now there's, it's, it's swimming in sugar, but it's starving of energy. So it's it's very difficult process of getting, not difficult, but more complex than, mm -hmm. than ketone, of getting sugar into the cell. What ketones, it's small cell, a molecule, gets right into the cell. So it has, the cell has energy. So what, so people say, I feel better, I feel more awake. Of course you do initially and for a while. But that doesn't mean that long-term benefit is there. Now let's look at how you achieve ketosis. Mm -hmm. It's not a natural state. You have to have this incredible diet that is also so high in saturated fat and, or fat and and very All, little in carbohydrates, less than 5% of carbohydrates. Initially, there's even reduction in inf inflammation with mm -hmm. ketone uh, studies. But long term, it's always about the long game. If people want short game, I'll give you 50 different ways where you will lose weight, cut off your arm. You, they, will actually, uh, yeah, <laughs> they, will, they will actually feel better. I have lots of pills out there that will make you feel better. Long term gain. Everything we're talking here is about long-term gain, the long game. I'm a Pittsburgh Steeler. It's a long game. Uh, it, it, it has to think about what could truly, how did your body evolve? Did it really evolve in this way? They said they bring paleo. Really? You're going to bring an example of people who only lived up to 30 years of age to give me health care for me living at 80 years of age? Mm -hmm. Does that even make sense? And if you think meat was the way to go, I was a hunter. We had a farm in Virginia with a shotgun. I barely shot anything weekend after weekend. Go chase a rabbit without a gun. I can't see. I'm trying to picture you with a shotgun. Yeah, that right was now. terrible. Like, that was my long, mind. long, no, time, long ago. time ago. <laughs> but, but so the, the science, the paleo, you know, the anthropology, everything is so wrong. I still say we're open. Show us the data. Let's not jump ahead of ourselves because it has public health implications. Yes. We're just beginning as physicians. We're terrible with this prevention side. We're just beginning to accept some of the things that have been proven to apply behaviorally. Now, all of a sudden, because somebody wants to sell the book of the day, and by the way, you know, plants are poisonous to you. And the first reference is wrong in the mm -hmm. book. I mean, yeah. so that's why it's, it's... I think I know what book you're talking about. Yeah. <laughs> But we need to say what works, what has been proven, we're open, let's apply this. And if anybody brings newer ideas, like eating paint off the wall is going to you know, give you less Alzheimer's, let's study that. But I would like you to try that first. Right. So the research right now is pretty unequivocal, like adopting a whole food plant-based diet is going to have a big impact yes. in a positive way. Mm -hmm. Are there... If I'm not mistaken, aren't there studies being done now on psychedelics on brain health and dementia? Is that true? Marijuana, marijuana is one or, or the yeah. components uh -huh. of it. It's, uh, it's CNR, yeah, and all the other components are being studied. Mm -hmm. And, and, and it, 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 you know, we're, we're excited because for a long time, social biases were stopping these powerful drugs from being studied. Again, either this way or this way. We don't know. But a chemical that directly binds to specific receptors is going to have consequences. So that should be studied. And, and many other drugs should be studied in a, in a very scientific and responsible way. Right. All right. So we we went through the nutrition part. But we, there's four other things here in your <laughs> book, right? We got, I mean, exercise is kind of 
self it's self evident, yeah. right? Uh, not but really. Are, but, but <laughs> all right. Well, what do you mean by that? So everybody comes to us and says, "What I, I walk? I walk around um, my neighborhood." They have an inflated sense of of what of what yeah, they're actually. I'm doing. active. I walk right. around my living room and my gardening. kitchen all day long. Uh-huh. And we tell them, "Well, that's wonderful, but that's not exercise. That's meditation." You know, walking around the neighborhood may be good for you. You're moving naturally. But for brain health, it has to be strenuous. There has to be some level where you're breaking a sweat and you're not able to finish a sentence when you're speaking. And there's been studies that actually show that in those moments where your strenuous activity comes to that moment where, you know, your heart rate is raised, that's when the chemicals start uh, being released in your blood, whether it's brain-derived neurotrophic factor or others. And those are the ones that make those connections. Those are the ones that increase the size of your hippocampi. As a matter of fact, there was a study a couple of years ago. Where Several, they, actually. Yeah, the, the one particular one yeah. in a large sample population where they compared um, individuals who just you know did stretching and some Pilates and yogas, and the others were... Um, working with a physical trainer and they did strenuous physical activity three to four times a week. Mm-hmm. And after two years, they had, they literally grew the size of their hippocampi. That's crazy. You know? Wow. And, yeah. and these are individuals who are that's amazing. You know, in their, in their uh, midlife. And that's, I think that's such an incredible and empowering uh, piece of information for all of us. When you're talking about exertion, can we get specific in terms of whether we're we're talking about aerobic exercise versus anaerobic exercise? Uh, so the, the data is still coming. Uh, some of the data is kind of interesting, exciting, and and uh, uh, kind of throws us for a loop. For example, people with bigger legs had lower dementia. A twin study. Really? Twin study. Twin study. So Identical they study bigger meaning like more, more thicker, muscle. like a more, more muscle mass. Yes. More muscle mass. Uh-huh. So, so the ones who were more active actually had a bigger brain from the so, same genetic background. Yeah. So it was it. So in, in research, do they have bigger legs because they're they're exercising more. Or do yeah, they, exactly. So <laughs> it's not just they have like, <laughs> no, no, no. They're they're muscle because, mass yeah. because they have muscle same mass. genes. Right. So there has to be something uh-huh. else. But directionality in science is important. Were they healthy? Therefore, they retain their muscle more. Or so, mm-hmm. But then other studies show that leg strength. Um, uh, has correlation with brain brain health and, and kind of makes sense because your blood gets to your heart well your blood gets to your heart because your legs have the muscles have to pump the ve- the veins to get it to the heart to the brain so that seems to be so even anaerobic exercise seems to have relationship with yeah. brain better brain health but definitely aerobic exercise mm-hmm. uh, repeatedly has been shown to to have a tremendous positive effect on the brain um, so that's that's one thing that that uh, oh as much as what was it one study was forty percent nearly forty percent reduction in chance of getting Alzheimer's yeah forty percent wow I mean, that's these are not small numbers forty percent right but when you're when you're kind of chagrined at the person who said well I walk around the block I right. mean that's kind of a blue zones thing right like it's it's not about exerting you know over exerting yourself it's just these are populations yeah. of people that are just kind of in slow perpetual motion throughout the day. So, so it's yeah. not one thing. So the, the, you, you hit it on a very good, good point. So a lot of people are highly educated yet they get dementia. Or others who have very little education yet they didn't get dementia because they ate well. And others who didn't, who, who ate, you know, their diet was okay and their education was okay, but they just did lots of exercise. And others who just had complex jobs. So my grandfather and her grandfather were probably the most brilliant uh, people you can imagine, yet they got the Alzheimer's. For them, it was diet and lack of activity mm-hmm. and these kind of things. So it's, it's the different contributors. So that's why we say it's a whole person component. It's not just diet. Right. It's not just this. It's the being mindful of a life uh, that encompasses all of those things. So the more of those things you do, the more protected you are. Mm-hmm. But even if you do some of them, that gives you a measure of protection. Can you exercise too much? Does it become bad? I'm asking for, for a friend. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. I don't know. I, I, I think, it, like, like Dean said, it just depends on everything else. If the, too much exercise is causing stress, then you're probably, you know, not doing yourself a favor. Right. I just want to make, I don't know if I, I just want to make sure I'm not injuring my brain by running long distances. I'm not banging my head against anything. That's but the thing. Like, I yeah. think if you do if it I traumatic, fall down, right. yeah, no, no, <laughs> yeah. 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 Your, your balance is probably better than 99% of people. That, no, Absolutely. but if you're doing like 
boxing and that kind of exercise is absolutely yeah. that's right. doing damage or there's getting no hurt on a regular basis inflammation uh-huh. inflammation in your legs and in your arms during physical activity that definitely yeah. you know uh, causes some level of damage do you see patients with tbi regularly we or do. Yes, you we do, do. Uh-huh. We do. it's interesting how like that's really come come into the conversation as yeah. a real thing and yeah. the impact on the nfl and kids playing football and everything you it know is, it is it's uh, quite scary we actually are in the process of trying to, um well it's uh, with the nfl the retired nfl group uh, uh bringing him into our uh clinic it hasn't been oh, finalized wow. or anything but but there's no doubt that people who get hit or not even hit to the head sudden deceleration you know this is a bony structure i mean if you ever get a skull you'll actually be be worried that you know there are bony edges there and the brain is floating in a liquid and it's not even a gelatinous liquid it's a liquid that easily moves the brain it's a little more um uh, viscous viscous than water but but it still moves easily so anytime you come to sudden stop that brain is still moving mm-hmm. so they say oh we we created this new helmet and this and how is the helmet going? How is that helmet going to stop the brain from moving within the skull? Mm-hmm. Right. Yeah. And my son always comes up with these things. What well, was this? The superhero where the the girl is falling at you know uh, fast speed and this superhero picks him up. So, no, nope, there is. She's she's, she's dead. Still. The brain stopped. It's a lot of fun watching Marvel movies with, with him. Yeah. Brain damage. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> You're like buzz killing every <laughs> single. No. no. So so repetitive trauma or repetitive deceleration absolutely yeah. the small bridging veins are going to be cut uh, the inflammation that builds up uh, absolutely and you don't have to lose consciousness necessarily you get brain damage even you know the lack of loss of consciousness and do these five factors of nutrition exercise sleep stress you know engagement all of that can those work to you know when you when you have somebody who has tbi traumatic brain injury can can these factors work to um, you know, prevent the mm-hmm. further development of that turning into a more profound dementia or Alzheimer's or, or, or can it be reversed or are those people just, it's about managing it? That's a great question. And that's where the idea of personalization of brain health comes in. So you look at the factors mm-hmm. that affects them the most and you address that aggressively. And of course, you know, bringing in the whole comprehensive lifestyle. For example, if somebody has We'll talk about it later, but if somebody has sleep apnea, you know, they're not sleeping well and there are moments during their sleep where they're not getting oxygen into their brain, you give them blueberries and the healthiest diet in the world and they're not going to benefit mm-hmm. from it. So it just depends on what areas need to be um, uh, attended first. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Uh, addressing, that's one, this cookie cutter concept, that's where we go wrong when it comes to brain health. It's complex. Uh, not to perseverate and repeat what you said, but we have to, every person comes to this journey of brain aging on in their own terms. We have to identify that 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 focus, that area that has affected their brain brain negatively, and that area that they can actually create success. That's where the personalization takes place. Mm-hmm. So unwind. This is the next category, yeah, right? Our favorite. And this is about this is about stress reduction mindfulness and specifically meditation yes right? yes yes it's not stress reduction it's identifying your stresses in life and there's there's a definition that we use you know good stress and bad stress and it kind of sounds funny but we do believe that there is actually a thing such as good stress and you know those are the activities that you own those are the situations that you understand and you can manage and on a, a regular purpose. basis. Mm-hmm. And it is bound to a purpose in life. And that's necessary because that keeps you challenged. That keeps you on the edge. That keeps you awake. Mm-hmm. And that keeps you motivated enough to do something about your life to move forward. Right. But, like I'm thinking about, sorry, I interrupted you no again. Problem, but no, like no, I, no. I'm thinking about the person who's retired, right? And then suddenly finds himself in the lazy boy chair, mm-hmm. bored and unchallenged yeah, right absolutely. is lacking that good stress that yes. leads to you know the advancement of of aging in fact yeah. that's the one state that has shown to be the biggest determiner of decline yeah. if a person on a high level job by the way the most protective thing even beyond food and everything we would love to say food it's the level of complexity of the job if they had a complex job that they loved all their life 
that was protective even beyond bad food and everything else. Mm-hmm. I'm not saying that people should just you know do that, but but it's protective. But if they had a high level job and then they retired and they didn't do anything, that determined the highest rate of decline in brain health. That's interesting. Mm-hmm. That's purpose. super interesting. Life with purpose. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Sorry, Aisha, I, I interrupted you. Please no. and then I pick <laughs> up where I where I where you were. We're flowing. Okay. We're flowing. It's a conversation. <laughs> I love it. Yeah. So keeping keeping yourself stimulated while also reducing the bad kind of stress. Though. Yes. Mm-hmm. Yes. It can literally eat away your brain. I mean, we have studies that show that um, people who had a rough childhood, whether it was physical or mental abuse they actually have a higher risk for developing dementia later on in life. And um, it makes sense when you look at um, people going through stress, there's specific hormones that are secreted in the brain, cortisol and others that um, change the physiology of the brain, that change the amount of blood supply going into Mm -hmm. the brain. And um, it actually causes formation of a lot of um, uh, oxidative byproducts that, you know, reduce those connections that, um, jeopardize the structure of brain cells and they're shrinking. There's literal shrinking of the brain during stress. Um, and so, um, identifying what stress is and getting rid of it and you're not in a magical way. We don't ask people to just sit down and not do anything, but to, um, try to focus on managing, um, our lives and managing and being organized, like for example, and uh, trying to minimize things and attending to all of them in the present that you mm-hmm. can, yeah, just being in the present. And that's the best way to go forward. This is the one chapter that's a little different than the other chapters. Yeah. We go into why meditation, why mindfulness, right. uh, what it does. It actually gives you ability to step back from the moment. We li- people think that urgent living, so m- living from minute to minute to minute, it increases cortisol levels and, and all that stuff. The ability to step back, be it consciously or through, gives you a higher view of everything and, and actually completely reduces those hormones. And they've done study after and increases oxytocin levels. Uh, Paul Zak and his oxytocin, the you know, happy uh, the happy hormone, the love hormone. So it increases that. These are important things. The moments that you can actually create that actually increase the oxytocin and positive hormones and reduce the negative hormones determine the shrinkage of the brain, literally. So we've instituted um, uh, this in our household with our children, yeah. um, Sophie, Tan, and Alex. And so we, what we do with them is mindful breathing. And I do this in, we do this in wow. lectures. Yes. We're huge. We did this in uh, the Sinai, Sinai temple, temple, 500 people, like 500 elderly. Individuals. I said, close your eyes. So they close. I said, something very simple. You'll see it's kind of, so breathe in. Breathe out. Just be aware of that. Breathing in and breathe out. Next, muscles. You know, you know how it is. The mm-hmm. muscle relaxation. Then put yourself in a beautiful place. <clears throat> and next, focus on one item. And we did this for 15 seconds. Yes. I said, open your eyes. And uh, I mean, this incredulous population, the elderly in the churches and the community centers, every time they say, this was amazing for 15 seconds. So the other day, we do this twice a day with the kids. And my daughter came and said, uh, Dad, my life has changed. And we were like laughing. I said, you have no right to say that. You're 10 years <laughs> old. Yeah. But, but, but this is important. And, and, and beach cities, Manhattan, Redondo, they do this uh, in schools. I mean, do they really? Yes. yes. Oh, wow. Mindfulness. Yeah, we're part of that project. Yeah. We're actually implementing is brain health. Is that part of the Blue Zone stuff that, that's that's down, yes. down in yes. Redondo? And now we're involved uh-huh. on the brain health side. Oh, wow. And they've done this way, way before us. Imagine teaching kids to manage stress. What better gift? Yeah, that's yeah. a beautiful thing. It is. Yeah. And it's really cool you know, to hear that coming from you guys, from an, from the perspective of neurologists, right, who are like rooted in the hard science. But you like, didn't expect that from cardiologists, did you? <laughs> no, yeah, no. But I mean, I have like two days ago, I was doing a podcast with Guru Singh, who's like a kundalini master. He's yeah. like, I talked to like, a lot of guys like yes, that. You yes. know, it's amazing. like I, I can, you know, I expect to hear these sorts of things from them. But like to hear to hear it come from, you know, hardcore scientists like like it's it's cool, right? Yeah. So, in that in that vein, are there studies where you can see the before and after MRIs and kind of really gauge the impact on on brain health with somebody who is you know 
performing a consistent meditation practice? There hasn't been a lot of studies, but yes, there are studies that have um, looked at, say, for example, Buddhist monks who meditate on a regular basis and um, they have um, lower risk of, of brain diseases. But I think it's an area that is expanding more and people are very excited about it. And mm -hmm. thankfully, we have tools. We have functional MRIs and other MRI sequences that actually goes deep down into the brain to see how meditation affects right. those, those cells and connections. I actually did two years or uh, year of uh, research at UCSD with fMRIs. Yes. <clears throat> these are MRIs that actually look at your brain while you're thinking, you're doing things. So they've done all these kind of studies, uh, free will studies and other things that have done with these MRIs. I they love give you functions like memory cards and things to learn and think uh -huh. about and listen different... to music and you see how the brain functions right. live. Yeah. So they've done that with meditation and, and repeatedly we know that dif different parts of the brain are brought into function. Um, the brain actually works at a different level. The greater detail has to be worked up uh, as far as how this has to uh, ha works for your long-term health and as far as brain health. Why is it not being done? Because first of all, it's costly. Second of all, you have to get rid of a lot of what in science we call confound, other things that could be contributing. So if you bring a Buddhist monk and put him on fMRI and you see brain has changed, then you have to say, well, this guy is doing a lot of other things that are beneficial as well. Mm -hmm. So Right. There's yeah. a lot of co-founding factors. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, sleep. Talk about sleep a little bit. Big, sleep. big, big yeah. part of our book. It's um, it's something that's not really discussed much, and um, you know we we lived in Los Angeles, and Dean and I joke about this all the time. You know, you there's always some detox going on. You know, detox of the day, eat this or do mm -hmm. that. In our opinion, the best type of detox. People is People talk about sleep. that in LA. They do. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't know. Yeah. Some people do. Um, and the best detox is just sleep. Restorative and, sleep. Yes. So, so what does that mean? That means that one is able to go through all the stages of sleep without any interruption. And um, there's been studies where one night of sleep deprivation has increased the amount of amyloid in the brain and the cerebrospinal fluid or the fluid that surrounds the brain exponentially. And wow. It's and inflammation. That's, and that's, that's just, one, just night. One, one night. One night of bad sleep for anybody, causes. or is that like a function of whether you have the proper gene or, or disposition to dementia? Or no, 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 no for, for anybody. Because inflammation. Those factors and were actually taken into consideration mm -hmm. during uh, during the analysis, and that's just incredible. And you know, they've done studies among night shift workers who have completely challenged their their cycle, their their biology, and they seem to not do very well in a lot of memory testing. And even among college students, you know, a good night's sleep actually tends to increase their their scores if they study very hard and if they sleep well, they have higher score the, compared to those who don't sleep who pull well. Pull the all-nighter and cram and do yeah, that. Yeah, I, I it doesn't those. work. And and when you look at the physiology, um, you know, Sleep is a mechanism where your memory is consolidated, or just to put it in simple terms, you know, there are files and folders created in the brain where all of these memories are placed. So it's easier for one to go and retrieve it later. And it also gets rid of all the quote unquote garbage that is deposited in the brain during the day. Mm. So it's essentially, you know, a garbage cleaning system and it consolidates memory in the brain and it's, it's, it's a very, very important thing to talk about. And so what are some of the things that affect sleep? Yeah, maybe, you know, not, not uh, having the time to go to sleep or a job, but even, you know, things as, uh, uh, such as sleep apnea, which is just crazy. Sleep apnea is a disease where you have um, a number of periods during your sleep where you stop breathing mm -hmm. and your brain doesn't get oxygen. And in one population, sleep apnea increased the risk of Alzheimer's disease by 70%. Wow. Yeah. 70%. 70. Yeah. And how so, many people suffer from sleep apnea? Way more than you would expect, especially as, as we get older or people are a little overweight or have these other chronic diseases. 
sleep apnea is a very common finding. It goes unnoticed most yeah. of the time yeah. because it's, you know, people don't actually say, hey, I snore or I wake up multiple times and I have a hard time breathing. Or I slept eight hours, but I was still tired the whole day. I feel terrible. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. And that's sleep apnea. So. so it prevents you from entering that deep restorative Correct. phase of sleep. Absolutely. And then the, the other thing about uh, medication, yes. I mean, you know, as physicians, we all, we, we are so quick on giving medication to make sure that, you know, one sleeps. Medications don't help because yeah, it knocks you out. But again, all of that sleep rhythm and the sleep cycles are, are you're not messed in the right, up. Yeah. You're not, you're not like going through the proper cycles. Exactly. Exactly. So, so so many people are on those pills. Yeah. yeah. So these are again easy remedies. Easy remedies. Do you want to knock somebody out? I mean, we saw Michael Jackson, I mean, propofol. propofol. Right. This is a medicine you give for surgery. In ICUs. Mm -hmm. In ICUs. So, um, um uh, you can knock people out, but it doesn't mean they have restorative sleep. Sleep cleans the brain. And when people do, another thing that uh, during sleep if you're not getting good sleep, these microglia, these are the molecules that actually clean up a brain. They start eating away at its own brain, at good brain, or at least the connections, the axons. So in one paper we wrote and some others uh, that um, uh, if you don't get good sleep, the brain starts eating itself. What do you mean eating itself? So microglia are these mo uh, these cells that actually clean up. They're the cleanup molecules or cells in the brain. Janitor cells. Janitor uh -huh. cells. And their job is at night, you have good night's sleep, the connections that are bad connections, it actually goes and eats those connections away or breaks them up and eats the and uh, other garbage that's there, it starts eating them up. If you don't have good sleep, they've seen that actually these microglia go and break up good connections in the brain and eat up cells. So it is actually destroying its own You're brain. You're literally cannibalizing yourself. You're cannibalizing exactly. yourself because That's of lack of sleep. Wow. So sleep is important. Uh, sleep, is, <coughs> we don't talk about it because it's... What it, you know, you just go to sleep, go in the night, you know, in a room and get knocked out. One of the most common problems in our population is sleep problems. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And the ones that have good sleep, they think they have good sleep because they have, they're taking medication. So if we could do anything beyond diet and everything else, it would be create a sleep center that teaches people simple things. Sleep hygiene. You know, we don't recognize that as we get older, we don't digest food as well that we might not hear it, hear the sound or the gurgling and all that, but you're still, your stomach's fun, uh, working. So eating an hour before sleep, it doesn't, you're, you're, that's going to keep you awake. That's and it going, doesn't necessarily have to be caffeine. It can be anything. Yeah. Just the process of digestion keeps us awake. I do that all the time. Yeah. Uh, I did that. I mean, yeah. you read in the book, that was a common thing. Yeah. And, and when I stopped that and a couple of other things, uh, my, my sleep became a lot better. Now the book is keeping me up, up and <laughs> that's, a, that's, a, that's, a, that's a different problem. Yeah. Well, you gotta, go, you gotta go back to the, the unwind, the unwind the shop. The paleo people attack you. Yeah. Uh, are they? Yeah, well, I should get so many saying? names. So oh, many yeah. names. Who's that, attacking you? No, it's like, yeah, it's just uh, uh, the cults. Yeah. yeah. Because they don't agree with you. They start attacking and, and I, I, Well, I, it's very, you know, this, this whole diet thing is very tribal. It is. You know, it I is. just watched a video earlier today, our friend Garth Davis, who yes. bravely went on the doctors. Saw that. Oh my God. I, I didn't watch it at the time. And I, I saw, uh, Garth write about what the experience was like for him and his frustration about it. And then plant-based news, which is a big YouTube yes. channel. Like he put together kind of like a whole video where he goes back and forth and does some analysis on it to kind of try to explain what's going on. Mm -hmm. And, and it just, it's like, wow, this is so emotional on both sides, yeah. you know, and, and, and we're so dug in, you know, yeah. and, and, you know, these debates where we're putting, you know, the Garths and the Lustigs or whoever it is and pitting them against each other. It's like, it's like dog fighting, yeah. you know, and it's like, it's not, it's not leading to a greater understanding. It's just creating tribalism in mm -hmm. the same way that we're seeing it being played out politically. And, you know, it's, it's a tricky thing. Like, I don't know what the way forward is, but the way that we're kind of navigating it right now, doesn't seem to be functioning in a yeah. helpful way. Mm -hmm. It's a confirmation bias. One of the biggest problem we have in, as human beings, our brain was designed what they call type one error. If you're running around, let's say paleolithic time, and you're just worried about survival and reproduction, mostly survival. Mm -hmm. And there's a bush there and you look at the bush and you say, if I do this, um, and I do the safe thing. It's, uh, you know, walk away 
um, or uh, the, the tiger is going to attack me or the saber tooth. Our decision is, is to do what we want to confirm, what we know. So our brain is designed to confirm the things that we're comfortable with at any cost. It doesn't matter how much education you have. In fact, the education just creates language to better that confirmation bias. So I think the way out, if possible, is to step back and not argue the thing, but the way to the thing. Mm -hmm. It's almost like philosophy. So, you know, it's what is the method we're using to come to conclusions? So the paleo people attacked that, but I have, you know, you had 20 people in your, uh, I have 5,000 people following me. I said, that's appeal to masses. But I have these doctors that said that's appeal to authority. But, uh, but, you know, this person did this and that's an anecdote, appeal to anecdote. The only way we can make decision is not absolute cause and effect. Who has the most data that shows and, and the right kind of data mm-hmm. that shows an outcome? Let's follow that for now and test the rest of them. Yeah, I think so. I think that what's so like baffling about the whole thing is that everybody's a scientist, right? So it should be about data and facts. Yeah. And yet, and, and, we're, and we're expecting it to play out that way. And we're underappreciating some of the things that you just referenced, like the, the level of emotion that goes into yeah. this and the confirmation bias on both sides. You know, yeah. this gets played out. Um, but it's like, these are the guys who are supposed to be above this. Like, you're not supposed to get emotional about it. It is supposed to be about the data. And it's just more complicated than it that. Is. You know, it, is. it really it is. is. You're absolutely right. All right. Uh, optimize. What are we talking about here? This is the fifth pillar in your protocol, your that's program. That's the fun part. I love the concept of optimization because that's, again, probably the core, um, the core of personalization optimizing cognitive activity what does that mean keep yourself on the edge keep yourself motivated and keep yourself challenged at all times and you know we see brain games and crossword puzzles and sudoku which you (laughs) don't like very much Mm -hmm. uh, being thrown at people but that's that's not what makes the brain Um, it has to be something that one can own and it has to be personalized so For example, when Dean and I see some patients, we ask them, so what did you do before you got to this point in your life? You know, what what were your hobbies? Um, And for example, we had a a patient who was a car mechanic and he hated his job and he had retired and Mm -hmm. he was having some cognitive impairment. And uh, we talked him into getting back into something that he loved and it was making cars so he just right. got some cars in his garage and he started fixing them and he felt so much better and you know over over a couple of years his his scores cognitive scores actually got better so it has to be something that one can do on a regular basis that brings a lot of fun and it has to be something that involves all of the domains of the brain whether it's vision whether it's hearing whether it's judgment decision making um all of these have to come work in concert yeah, getting back to blue zones. Uh, so, yeah, they ate well. They walked naturally, so that might have helped. And better than not walking, you know, that's uh, the, better than driving all the uh, everywhere. But the mental activity there is the social activity. Mm-hmm. Right. It's a, it's the social it engagement, right? Is. That's really at the core of this whole thing. That's exactly right. That's yeah. Exactly. It actually maximizes the cognitive activity. Right. So I if think. you're not, you're, you're just sitting alone at home in, in a dark room doing crossword puzzles. Right. That's not, yeah. that's not what you're talking about. Right. A- another measure of disengagement was uh, once a couple of studies came as far as hearing. And we see this often. Yes. Uh, as people get older, as their hearing diminishes, I don't mean deafness, even minimally, there's a correlation between loss of hearing and uh, cognitive capacity. So even if the, it's not even social, just ambient noise seems to keep the... Oh, because un- unconsciously it, your, your brain is doing things that exactly. you're not even aware of. So as you lose hearing, of course, your, your connection with the people goes down. You have a conversation with somebody and you're a millisecond off because of hearing. That's going to make you, without thinking, that, 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 that language, remember I, I said earlier, you, you come up with, I don't like this anymore. So they become disengaged from communities I mean, over and over again. is almost a surrogate of loneliness. It is. It's, it's you being completely disconnected. Right. Yeah. Right, right. And, and a 10% increase, that just hearing loss, contributed to 10% of dementias. So wow. one of the first things we do is check the hearing. I mean, they think they're not having bad hearing, but 
as we get older, we do. The most shocking statistic in your book was uh, the statistic that um, the spouse of someone with Alzheimer's mm. is 600% more likely to develop the disease. It's, it's 600%. Incredible. It's incredible, isn't it? And it plays to that social piece, right? I mean, what is going on with that? Yeah. Well, it, that is a phenomenal example of you know the complexity of the disease. I mean, obviously, it's not genetics that causes it. So it has to be shared environment. You know, after we're living together, you eat the same thing, you move the same way, you sleep, your sleep patterns are similar, you engage in the community in the same way. So obviously, because because the um, the un- unhealthy environment caused Alzheimer's in one mm-hmm. partner, it affects the other one as well. The stress levels. The stress, of the course. St- yes. Imagine stress levels that Aisha causes in my life. Uh, <laughs> no, I'm I just, would it's completely so. the opposite. <laughs> She's the anti-inflammation person. No, but and but you're the anti-stress. It, no, it's the it's the shared environment. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, uh, repeatedly, you start eating the same foods, mm-hmm. even though well, you were a chocolate person and I was a steak and cheese person, mm-hmm. but now we are kind of well, we're plant based now, but very much the same activity level. We exercise together, right? right? Uh, so that's critical. In fact, in, my, in our program, we we encourage people, the husbands and wives or partners, to come together mm-hmm. because it, it's impossible for us to apply diet change to one person, right. and the other person is doing whatever they want. No, the it's household not has to work. change. Of course, yeah. of course, it makes it a disease of the of the family. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, if if your kitchen is not changed entirely, and obviously there will be times when you will eat unhealthy food. So. Right. We we once involved what? How many family members in your 14. clinic? Fourteen. Yeah, we remember like fourteen individuals 14. came wow. to this clinic because they all wanted to invest in this lifestyle, and that's how it works. I love the grandchildren to be involved yes. because if we want culture change, we know now know data shows that if you start earlier, the 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 teenagers actually change the food in the household more than the other way around. Mm-hmm. So I had the the grandchildren there and giving them speech and giving them, you know, kind of coax them into it and say, you have the power to change the family. And, uh, and, and that's a good way to learn empathy where your grandfather is suffering from Alzheimer's yeah. and you don't preach empathy, you live it. Yeah. So we love the uh, involvement of the entire family. What have been some of the success stories that you've experienced with some of your patients that you've put through this program? Many, many. Oh my goodness, there, there are many. Um, they've been particularly with this whole comprehensive um, approach, um, not just diet, not just exercise. I mean, there, there are stories in particular ones as well. But, you know, we um, remember that lady who um, was a high functioning person, professor, very knowledgeable. And she was stunned that she was, you know, experiencing cognitive impairment. But um, we found out that she had sleep apnea and we found Mm. out that she had incredible amount of stress in her job. I mean, there were things that were completely out of her control. So just to identify those, you know, treating her sleep apnea, modifying her diet, and for her to look into other venues that were close to her um, job and to her, you know, um, uh, her level of education or qualifications, um, she completely turned around and she actually became an advocate for for brain health. Wow, that's amazing. Yeah, those uh, to me, I like the ones that were... It's not that, that magic thing that we find. Sleep apnea is easy. You find that, you correct that, you, you see a huge difference. Mm-hmm. You see people who are on the wrong diet and they think they're on the right diet and you change that and you definitely see. For example, sugar. First three weeks, four weeks, people have a hard time giving up sugar. Yeah. I mean, very hard time. By the fifth week, sixth week, they come and say, I feel a fog lifting. So Clarity. that's not one case. Always talk about Multiple yeah. cases of this. I mean, over and over again. But the cases I love is that when we applied one little thing here, one little thing here, one little, you know, and each of the domains. And, and, and of course, you saw the difference, but you see a change in level of motivation. These people become, they want to be the coaches. Yeah. They want to be your coaches oh, wow. out there. That's cool. Uh, so uh, that makes medicine completely different than cutting and pilling, you know, giving pills. Here's right. a prescription. Right. It makes it so much more fun. Um, I just lost my train of thought. What was I going to ask? I had this awesome question. Oh, no. One thing that, well, it'll come back to me in a minute, but, but, uh, 
one uh, another statistic that I thought was interesting was um, that two thirds of the people that suffer from this are women. Yes, mm-hmm. and and that we don't really know why that's the case. Is that is that correct? Mm-hmm. That's true. There are some theories out there that explain some part of of that picture. Um, so you know, people have looked at hormones and how. Uh, you know, after menopause, the physiology of a woman changes or the effect of multiple pregnancies on brain health Mm -hmm. and body health in general. Um, But, you know, one of the strongest and um, um, most uh, interesting uh, concept that has surfaced is uh, the fact that um, the women who have Alzheimer's disease now and have been detected to have cognitive impairment come from a time where um, they were probably not as challenged as men were Mm -hmm. as far as their job is concerned and the amount of stress that was put on these women was much higher than women now we've evolved as a society and so we're trying to find out you know what were the differences as far as education level is concerned as far as cognitive reserve and as far as the amount of stress and other physiological determinants that made these women have more Alzheimer's now. Mm-hmm. So it's still, we're still trying to understand Learn it better. That. Yeah. But it's a crazy number and, you know, more women are suffering. Yeah. It's, uh, I, I was not aware of that. Yeah. It's crazy. And then two thirds of caregivers are also women. Yes. Mm-hmm. So, and, and, and they suffer from the consequence of taking care of a father right. or mother that has. Which uh, puts them at a higher risk. What is your opinion on people who go and, and get their genetic testing done, the 23 and me's and all of that, and you know come to you and say, I have the gene or I don't have the gene or what have you? Yeah, that happens a lot. So I have two grandparents who had Alzheimer's and you have had, and uh, let, and I forget a lot of things. I lose a lot of things. Uh-huh. I, for, for I can names, attest to that. I, I, he more, forgets his more, jackets more all Sudoku. the time. <laughs> <laughs> I probably would be much more rapid in decline. No, it's, so I, at this point, and, and it's evident that it's because we're, we live the most crazy, love, busy and passionate and loving, you know, lovely life. I mean, but, but it's very busy, multiple a things. A lot of elements. Mm-hmm. A lot of elements. Very colorful. And, um, uh, but if, let's say I take the gene, genetic test, and I find out that I have APOE4 and another APOE4 and some other genes. So now I forget my uh, something. What do you think I'm going to do? I'm going to attribute of it to course, my you're genes. Of immediately leap to, yes. oh, this is inherent. It's happening. Yeah. You know. And that that's not just me being motivated. So a lot of people say, oh, that's good for me because I'm, I'm going to be motivated. No, that's not motivation. That is going to be at a level of stress and anxiety that you that is going to be damaging. It's Until, almost becoming a self fulfilling prophecy. Is, Whatever yeah. you do, you attribute it to that. And Correct. we've seen people do that all the time. Exactly. So I say, live as if you have the genes, and let the outcome speak for itself. Mm-hmm. Because if you find out that you have the genes, the anxiety, because we don't have a cure for the genes at this point, maybe in a few years with this CRISPR thing and all these genetic uh, manipulations that we can do, and it will happen. No matter how many people say this is not natural, it, it, that's... It's definitely going to happen. It's going to happen. It's already yeah. happening. It is. It is. It is. Like leukemia and other diseases and, and sickle cell. I mean, mm-hmm. we've seen children suffer from oh. sickle cell. Like, yeah. I, sickle I don't want to see that. Sickle cells at the forefront of like, what's happening these things. with that right now. But even with these genes, it will, it will happen. But until then... Do you want to live with that kind of anxiety every time you forget where your park, your car was parked last night? We would, <laughs> yeah, I would have been we a You to check yourself in your own clinic. So yeah. I say, if it's not in the research setting, there's no benefit at this point. Live as if you have the genetic risk. Change your lifestyle because it's not just for Alzheimer's. That lifestyle is going to affect your heart, mm-hmm. your your immune system, your mood, depression, anxiety. Um, studies have shown that the best form of treatment of a depression, 300% better than any drug out there is exercise. Exercise, yeah. So live it and then let, let the genes play themselves out. Among these, these five factors, nutrition, exercise, sleep, uh, stress management, engagement, is there one that's more important than the other? Is it the interplay of the five? Like if somebody had to you know, pick one thing to begin with, and they're overwhelmed by the five, like what is the most important of all of these to kind of catalyze that journey? I think for the majority it's food, <laughs> yep, without a doubt, because how could it not be? It's something that we put in our bodies three or four times a day. It's the most important environmental factor for us. It makes or breaks your brain. 
But then again, it depends on, you know, what are some of the proclivities for Alzheimer's disease or for brain diseases in general and to focus on the one that is uh, the most affected. Mm -hmm. I agree with you fully. Um, I mean, let's take the personal thing out. Let's say that we don't find something unique in this person that, that, that we need to address right away. In general, we would say food, definitely. Mm -hmm. And then the easiest one is exercise. And for me, exercise is not going to the gym. I mean, when I say to people, some of these gyms, you have to get dressed up more than some oh, clubs, goodness. you know. It's, it's just so tough too much. going to the gym. Yeah. Anything that takes away impediment towards exercise, they say, oh, you, you want to exercise? run to the gym. I said, no, I want a limo to come and pick me up. Nobody does. But let's say, no. well, maybe when you were at Cedar sinai in West yeah, Hollywood. Yeah. No, we were, we were the directors of the brain health uh, program and we were the only one with a Toyota Sienna that you uh -huh. saw. But, uh, but, but the, 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 the most important thing is that it institutes, uh, do something that's proximal and easy. So I say, if I was secretary of health and human services, I would have connected everybody's TV to a recumbent bike. So it wouldn't work unless they're rolling. Mm -hmm. That would have reduced healthcare I like that. costs significantly. Nobody's going to do that. Nobody's going to vote for you. No, nobody will. Well, it's not a voting <laughs> position anyway. But but it, it is important to bring it to your living space, and then whatever else you do extra is fantastic. So for my sixty-year-olds and fifty-year-olds, I said get a little foot pedal exerciser or a, a recumbent bike, watch your news, and then go slow, roll slow. Yeah. You know, two miles an hour or an hour, a mile an hour, and then every few commercials just rev it up. You've just changed our use life. The, use the commercials to do your intervals. Yes, yes. Exactly. interval. Yeah. I mean, how how beautiful is that? So you're going to do so, aerobic and the anaerobic. Exactly. So there's no balance problem because you're sitting. There's no clothing. You know, you, you can do it naked if you want. I would rather uh -huh. not if they. <laughs> 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 yeah. They can they can do it in the privacy of their home. They can read something while doing that. They can watch and learn something on YouTube. So to me, that would be wonderful, and it's cheap. You, if you can't afford the recumbent bike. Get one of those foot pedal exercisers and put it on your beautiful, comfortable seat. So the seat's not uncomfortable. And you just do that. And you've done aerobic. You've done anaerobic. And, you know, it's wonderful. That's my easy uh, um, addition. Prescription. Yeah. Prescription. I think you, you usually the way that I, we got to wrap it up, but the, the way that I end conversations when I have doctors on the show is I ask them. Uh, if they woke up in a parallel universe and found themselves to be uh, the Surgeon General, what would be the first order of business? Or what, what are the policies, the, the legislation that you would like to see get pushed forward? So we have the, the bike power in the TVs. We're <laughs> going to put that into motion. We're going to pass that law. What else would you do if you were in that capacity? Well, there are a lot of things. I would... I would probably um, make every restaurant offer one healthy dish, one heart healthy dish that has been approved um, for, for the brain. Mm. I think people need to have choices. A lot of us want to be with friends, want to be with family members, but health doesn't necessarily have to be synonymous with deprivation. Mm -hmm. No, absolutely. And, and I, I would focus on prevention. I would actually create incentivize prevention. So <clears throat> doctors, healthcare systems would have educational programs for what prevention means, first of all, and then incentivize it financially, both at the public health side, which is the community, and in the hospital and clinic side to actually do prevention instead of sick care only. That would be uh, <clears throat> wonderful. Uh, and in a way, if you can, if you do the lump payment where this person's life is, let's say, eight thousand dollars, and if if that actually incentivizes it, meaning that if you keep them out of the hospital, you get more of the money. Mm -hmm. So, how do you keep them out of the hospital? Is teach them how to how to uh, prevent the disease themselves. Yeah. I mean, I think the keys to the kingdom really are in finding a way to revolutionize our healthcare system to prioritize prevention. Yeah. You know, it's like, it's just not set up that way right now. And until we shift focus, we're going to continue down this path that we know is not working. Yes. Absolutely. So. Absolutely. Well, thank you for doing this and sharing your message. You know, I think as a sort of primary takeaway from your book, um, I think it's really empowering, 
you know, because it's basically telling people like, look, you can control this, like whatever your genetic disposition is, uh, you know, that gene need not be necessarily expressed. And here are the things that you can do that we have seen and that has been proven to maintain your brain health and take, you know, to, to, you know, set you up in the best position to avoid having to go down this road, because this really is an epidemic that is just decimating lives everywhere we look. And, and the rate at which it's accelerating is mm -hmm. beyond alarming, right? So to Absolutely. the extent that we can all, you know, take to heart these measures and start to implement these changes in our lives and try to, <clears throat> you know, serve as a, a lighthouse or a source of inspiration for our loved ones who we see heading in this direction. I think this is really important work. And I thank you for writing this book and for the work that you do. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. You said it beautifully. What do you got? What's up? What's next for you guys? Are you writing another book? Or what are you doing? <clears throat> we are. Yes. We and we're are, working on that. We're yeah. working on that and um, really putting in a lot of effort to um, expand this into different communities, whether yeah. it's in San Bernardino or the beach cities and involving and training community members to take it upon themselves to spread the message. Yeah. And like I said, most of the, uh, actually all of the profits go to this foundation. And if anybody wants to partner with us for us to come there and give workshops on, on lifestyle and prevention, we're willing to pay out of our own pocket to come and fly there and, and help the community. Oh, that's amazing. Build this. Absolutely. Wow. Absolutely. So if somebody's listening to this and, and they want to take you up on that, how do they get in touch with you? They, they, yeah. they can get in touch with us through our website um, and our social media. We are teamsharesi.com. Um, and we would, uh, we're very responsive. We'd be happy to, you know, set something up with them. Right. It'll Team a, shares. I S H E R Z A I.com. Right. Yes. right? Yes. That's cool. Have you, I know, you know, Dan Butner, um, yes. have you spoken to him about perhaps collaborating with the work that he's doing with blue zones in some kind of official way? Like, it seems like it would be, there's a natural fit. We have, we yes. have, and we will. And so far, we're actually picking the fruits of, that he's laid down, which is in the beach cities. We're mm -hmm. doing the brain health side of it, but we would love to because I told him several times. We told him yes. that the, the public health that that he's doing is more beneficial than a thousand doctors uh, yeah. because uh, it makes it so easily palatable. I mean, he shows it in populations. People, people, you said it. If they don't see it in this story format, they're not going to believe it. But he shows the stories mm. in thousands of people in regions. It's wonderful. It's unbelievable. Yeah, it is. All right. Thanks, you guys. Thank, Thank you. you. So Thank you. I, I end the show by saying peace and plants at the very end. But I thought <laughs> since there's two of you, usually I'm just talking to one person. You guys can, like, take us out by saying that. Peace, peace and, and plants. plants. Oh, Fantastic. Thanks, you guys. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you. Cool. Thank you. Thank you.